It's okay. it's all Dan's fault. We're all agreed. You know, he's uh, Dan's demand. Dan's you know? demand. I mean, what is the origin? We're, we're going. It's time now for the professors and Marianne. Marianne Cummings is with us and Professor Adnan Hussein. What is the origin of scapegoat? You're you're a religion professor. What is I, I'm not know, testing uh, you. I'm just trying to. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure myself. I would probably if I'm guessing, since I don't know the actual origins of the word scapegoat or what phenomenon was uh coined um and characterized by this this term scapegoat i would think that it might be one of these kind of totemic sorts of um absorbing of yes. the evil in a kind yeah. of totem yeah. and then you sacrifice and right and you punish yeah you punish uh you know this animal because you can't do that to the people or something right. like this or right. there's something that's a little bit abstracted so you kind of put it in a physical sort of form um, and choose one, you know, animal to make the object of, of, of this kind of ritualized purgation um, of evil. Ah. Um, it's a kind of fetish object, you know, or something, you know, like a sin eater. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, that could that's be it. I mean, I should look it up and kind of see if I can I'm find sure anything that's find a little it on bit more Albert substantive. Internet. But I think, but I, think I remember be. reading about this in grade school. Yeah, it, it seemed to go through the town. And I don't know where this was. Yeah. But basically, somewhere were, in Europe, no yes, doubt. Somewhere Probably in Europe. Like a, that a dark German continent. village, you know, small town in Bavaria or something. Right. That would be my guess. <laughs> but why not escape cat? I mean, I don't I mean, oh, no, you're cat yeah. people. So yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, cat people. yeah, you're cat people. All right. I'm just. Uh, I saw a nobody's a goat person. That's right. I mean, so that might be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a video of a very respectable professor, one I really have admiration for, uh, videotaping him and his family walking by a cat in a box, swiping at their legs. He seemed to have been very amused by a a, a cat hiding in a box who would. Swipe. Absolutely. They are oh, just yeah. the cutest devilish little things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they are. When you sacrifice something at the altar, did the high priests, at least, I guess, in the Old Testament, they ate? When, when you brought and sacrificed things to God, that was also going to feed the high priests, right? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, reserving uh, a certain, you know, uh, amount of produce in fertility cults or animals, uh, livestock um, for the priestly caste. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, all animal sacrifice and even just uh, the eating of animals. I mean, if you look at indigenous uh, traditions and spiritualities, you know, there is this idea that um, you know, this is a living being that you're taking the life. That is a very serious thing to be doing on some level. And although life, the life cycle requires it, there's some, you know, some element of having to, uh, you know, pay homage to the life that you're taking, ask its permission, or at least a prayer of like, you know, why you're doing this. And we have, you know, in the consumption of animals, gotten completely away from that. Uh, Actually, and industrialized Temple Grandin. food, agriculture, you know, but even in smaller scale agriculture, you know, you get to know the animals. And uh -huh. so the eating of them is actually something both natural in a, in a way, but it is also uh, serious, which is why you have all of these sacrifice. You know, how do you slaughter? You know, why is there kosher? It needs to be blessed. It's partly also because you can't spill blood without it being, you know, sanctified in some way. Right. Um, so I think that that element is also there in the animal sacrifice. I mean, that's what it, I think perhaps comes from uh, are the larger provisions that, well, if other people are going to do it, it needs to be now encompassed somehow within the sacred you know, and it's not something to be done thoughtlessly. It's not something to be done extravagantly and without, you know, care and respect. 
So I think those are the elements that are part of that um, ritualized relationship to animals and their consumption and sacrifice. Okay. Well, Professor Marianne, before we move on, was there yeah, some? I was just going to say, listening to Adnan, um, you, have you heard of Temple Graydon? She's a very famous autistic person, but her parents were very progressive for their age and they didn't institutionalize her, but she was spent years at her aunt and uncle's farm and, you know, seeing how the animals were raised and what calmed them down. And uh, she ended up getting a PhD in animal husbandry and she has designed slaughterhouses. Hmm. And so her perspective is very interesting because she says, uh, you know, people have forgotten that the slaughter of animals for food is a sacred act. Yeah. She says in, in her book, so she designs these as the animals are walking around kind of spiral-like so the animals don't see what's coming, but they keep moving and it's, there's something very calming to them. And they said, and, and the way she sets up these slaughterhouses is that people almost have to be more, it sounds weird, but when she says it, it makes perfect sense that, you know, you have to remember what a sacred act it is to kill somebody to another for other lives to live yeah yes that's i i think that's spiritually damaging when we have complete disconnect i mean i hated that idea when i was a kid and felt comforted when i read about native americans having actually said a prayer over the deer mm -hmm. they just killed mm -hmm. asking this the deer spirits for forgiveness right this made me feel better i've always found being a vegan and being cruel to humans to be very satisfying. <laughs> I just find that very nourishing. Well, yeah, there are nice some famous there. mass murderers who were vegetarians <laughs> or, you know, we're yeah. really concerned about animal welfare and animal uh, rights. Well, I may, right. I want to uh, correct myself. I think I was talking to Howie Klein and I was criticizing the DA Alvin Bragg for bringing up Trump on this chicken shit charge of, yeah. you know, campaign fine, you know, arcane campaign finance law. And the more I read about it and the more people wrote to me and corrected me, the more I realized that it's actually going to assist Letitia James, the state attorney general in prosecuting Trump and getting him under oath. He's forging, but, Allegedly, this is what they're going to charge him with, forging business documents and lying about how he categorized these payments to Michael Cohen. So I, I take that back. I have a feeling, Professor Marianne, you agree with my original statement. Well, you know, it, all of these people, you know, are the, the, the morality of these politicians is questionable at best. But... You're talking about Alvin Bragg. You're talking about because you know what he will not, and what none of them will ever be prosecuted for. Are their real crimes? I mean, right. there's four decades of real Trump family crimes. You know, people he has really hurt. Um, this kind of reminded me of the prosecution of John Edwards. Remember that? And he had a he had a love child, which I think is videographer, and he wanted mm -hmm. to keep it secret from his wife. So his old family friend, Bunny Mellon, sure of the Carnegie Mellon, you know, crowd. Uh, Slow was, down, because I don't remember this as. Go ahead. OK, so what happened was that she basically she and another friend of John uh, of John Edwards paid this woman to keep her, you know, set up someplace with her child and keep it under wraps. And um, and basically, you know, to, d during his his 2008 campaign, the 2007 2008 campaign, right. um, but it was discovered, and uh, so he was prosecuted. And I was stunned that the Obama administration goes after a formal political rival on something so stupid. You know, yes, it, it, basically the legal construct was these were effectively campaign contributions and they weren't properly, the documents were, you know, the, it was fraudulent reporting to the FC, the FEC about your campaign's finances. 
And I just rolled my eyes. And, you know, even people thinking, well, you, we need to get to the bottom of this and know what happens. And I said, wait a minute, we know exactly what happened because I was reading the National Enquirer <laughs> wrote the story and they absolutely get this crap right. I mean, there's nothing that came out that wasn't already revealed by the National Enquirer. And the bottom line was they went, they prosecuted him and went to trial and he won. Oh, he did win. Oh, he won. Yeah. Good. I, yeah, I don't people re- forget. Yeah, he was he came off, you know, as, as, as kind of a lightweight. But the fact is, he was a very, very smart lawyer. I voted for him in 2008. I voted for him, too. He was the I only was, one. I, he was the most progressive. Two Americas. Yeah, I like that. He was that. the only one talking about the two Americas. But by it, the time that election, I voted early. And by the time election day, I think he had already dropped out. Me, too. But I voted for him anyway. I did. I vote, in California, I did. it was I, I wrote him in because I, Hillary and Obama weren't talking about income inequality. And he was. But anyway, he's just playing, you know, to me, this is just more of and this is an, in some weird way. You've got to hand it to Trump for understanding, playing to the room, understanding, you know, at least uh, the lizard brain level American politics. So he announces Trump that they're going to indict him. Oh, yeah. Tuesday's the day or Wednesday's. I mean, there's all this storm and drong and, mm-hmm. dr- and drama in, in New York. And everybody is like, you know, preparing themselves for judicial Armageddon. And then there's just this, you know, of course, that all turned out to be nonsense. And, and Alvin Bragg, I don't know who this guy really is, but he is not ready for he is not ready for prime time. Let's put it this way, because this is a very political thing, whether you would think about well, we're just the wheels of justice and so on. No, this is this is political. And um, so now we've got this letter that presumably uh, is from that says Michael Cohen paid the money to what's her face to Stormy Daniels. And, I, you know, to me, this is just this is Trump playing the media. I mean, they're just he's just playing the media like this. And, you know, so I have no idea if they're, and if they will get their act together to next by next week and arrest him. But there is a political now that it's so buffoonish and, and, and hush money to a mistress is so not applicable to anybody's lives and the problems people are having right now. I just don't think it's going to be, I, I think it might possibly help Trump. Unless they're building a case to get him to lie, to get him under oath, to lie about how he conducted business, his business practices. So, it, but, you know, he didn't conduct his business practice. <clears throat> That's the weird thing about Trump. It's always somebody else. Trump doesn't have email. Trump never writes anything down. He doesn't have a journal, you know, um, it, and Trump himself is not big on unexpressed thoughts. So it's like, if it's in his head, it's out of his mouth. I I just don't know what they're going to uncover. And, you know, it's it seems to me that if they had a slam dunk, I mean, this stuff is not new. If they had a slam dunk case, you know, to get Trump this way, they would have been doing it like, you know, long before now. So maybe it... So there's a suspicion of the timing of this whole thing. Professor what? Hussein, uh, I, I want to talk about Putin and the ICC in a second. Mm-hmm. There eventually is going to be a Trump studies class at universities. How do you justify as as the chairman of the religion department, a, a university? Uh, would there be a Trump chair, somebody who studies this administration? I mean, he's, he is consequential, isn't he? Well, I mean, I think, of course, uh, there's plenty of uh, American historians who are going to want to reflect upon this era, its causes, its consequences, um, because it seems uh, to be very important in uh, driving a direction of right-wing populism that has become dominant in many ways in the Republican Party and uh, represents some kind of a challenge to 
the previous era of the third way kind of uh, neoliberal, um, you know, triangulation. We're seeing politics uh, develop in a different direction. And so they will want to study uh, that era. I don't know how much the figure of Trump himself is going to be so, you know, crucial, but people who do specialize in presidential politics will, of course, have a lot to say about you know, what made him unique, special, unfit, or what, you know, however they'll want to characterize Trump's particular four year and possible, you never know, second administration. So, um, you know, there will be, you know, components of this study that, you know, have to be dealt with and have to be, you know, uh, encountered in American presidential politics electoral politics, but I think it, it will be significant um, more for the movement and what he seemed to symbolize for people and how it is that somebody who was very much outside the mainstream of American presidential fitness for candidates and so on managed to end up becoming president. So, yeah, of course there will be. I mean, because this is an interesting moment in history. I mean, interesting in the sense that it could be scary, it gets terrifying, right. um, it's absurd, um, but it is clearly consequential. And there's a phenomenon that has to be uh, explained. And I think already there's been so much, you know, that's been written about about his administration and about right wing, you know, uh, the right wing in the United States and its transformation from you know, a kind of establishment uh, movement politics from, you know, the evangelical Christian conservative right. movement um, and its co-optation really by, you know, kind of the corporate control that existed in the Republican Party. And now that seems, I wouldn't say completely in jeopardy, but the terms of that relationship are being renegotiated. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be, you know, very interesting. We had, a as you were talking, uh, it occurred to me we had a real genuine revolution when he got elected. This is somebody who has absolutely no government background for the first time, at least in the 20th century and the 21st century. I don't believe anybody ever came out of nowhere the way Donald Trump did. He was a businessman. Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. He, he didn't. He, he was, was governor. President. Wasn't he governor of New Jersey, too? I think he might have been governor of New Jersey. I don't think so, but I think he kind of came out of just academia. I think he was president of Princeton and then he became governor. Oh, this is okay. what happens when I, I if Ann Lee were here, we would. Yes, we would we remember. Would, we yes, would, we would know this. But all I have to say on that is, of course, you know, a university professor is eminently qualified to run <laughs> <laughs> power. Or, or a department. No better chair. training, really. I mean, if you can't like knock the heads in a, you know, in the small stakes <laughs> and bitter feuds of academia, then you know there's no hope for you for partisan politics at the federal level. So right. So, uh, what is the glue that holds his coalition together? Is it Christian white nationalism? I was reading last night. Somebody, I don't know where I read it, but they said. Something to the effect that what's unshakable with MAGA is the, the Christian right, far right nationalism. You have Orthodox Jews, you know, you, you have the far right religious zealots. Uh, is that the glue? Well, I wish Barry, uh, Re Reverend Barry Lynn was here since he knows these communities so well. Um, because to my mind, it's always been a really strange uh, way in which he's become the bearer, almost messianic figure of 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 uh, the religious right. Uh, it's true that they seem to be an unshakable um, part, but they weren't the original. I don't know if they were really the original base. Um, no. You know, they gained him attention in the primaries. I think that was a coalition that was forged. They were convinced that he was the suitable bearer of their hopes uh, for a very fundamental change. Um, 
But I think that was something they had to be convinced of because um, he doesn't appear to be a very devout uh, person. He has not. Yeah, I, I find it very funny, you know, that uh, he doesn't even really go through the motions in a very serious way of like, you know, the way politicians typically do about their bona fides as a religious person talking about that all the time. I think he made rather perfunctory gestures in the direction. But he was willing to turn over judicial nominees and basically say, you get me in power, I will adopt your agenda. And they've never really had somebody who was in a position to do so be per- that frank, and I think. And that, that transactional? Open. Yeah, that transactional. I, mean, was, I think they, that yeah. before, but with all due respect for, you know, uh, Reverend Barry, um, really what got Trump into politics. I mean, he'd been into showbiz, right? Politics. I mean, and, and quite frankly, I mean, I've been disgusted with Donald Trump for decades, but, you know, long after he'd established himself as racist and outrageous and sexist, I mean, Oprah was his friend, the Clintons were his friends, everybody was his friends. I mean, because he was kind of the happening guy. So, uh, you know, and so people think that somehow his Machiavellian political streak was Roy Kahn. No, Roy Kahn was his employee. He didn't teach him anything. The guy that introduced Trump to like politics in a very sociological way was Vince McMahon, who was mm. the president of the World West Wrestling Federation. Yeah. And it's when Trump got involved with that. And, and I have to tell you, there's a sizable chunk of the population that is, you know, really into wrestling. Uh, my, my friend's kid was into wrestling. We went down and saw these wrestling matches. Oh, my God. They are like modern day gladiators. I mean, the whole spectacular show. And there's a morality play going on. You know, they're the heels. They're the heroes. And by the way, it's the heels that everybody shows up to see. And they're the ones that become the big stars. Like Dwayne Johnson was the heel. The Rock, you know, Uh Hulk Hogan was the heel. I mean, they started out as the bad guys and then the narrative switched and they they became popular. Trump tapped into a lot of that kind of, you know, just the whole politics just being a big stage and people projecting their morality or narratives onto it. And, you know, so when he was on the stage in the early in the uh, Republican primary debates, Holy crap, he owned that stage. It was amazing to watch and pretty funny, especially when he essentially ended Jeb Bush's career. Mm-hmm. Saying the thing that I wish, why hadn't Democrats been saying for 10 years, your brother didn't keep us safe. And then he's on the stage going, look, I know, I, like, I know what these politicians do. They go, they, they do what the money tells them. I know, I've given all these guys money. Yeah. And of course, when well, Marco Rubio pipes up, you never gave me any money. Oh, 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 little Marco. Yes, I almost forgot about you. It's so, I mean, the guy just, he dominated that stage. Mm-hmm. And it's like he was a natural because he understood the American psyche in a way that most people, like, for instance, uh, the Clintons can't because they're in this very privileged bubble for a long time. Right. I remember the Church of the Subgenius. One of the teachings is if you're not if you're not watching TV, you have no idea what America is. <laughs> and there's some truth to that. Oh, my God. That's how he that's his genius. That's his genius. I had no idea. By the way, I kind of vaguely knew about The Apprentice. I had no idea it was that long running. And when my friend told me about that, I've, and my I've, friend, because she watched it religiously and she said, oh, it was the most t- entertaining thing on television. And uh, then and, and basically the feud with Obama announcing the capture of Osama bin Laden that Sunday night, mm-hmm. that preempted the season finale of The Apprentice. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I'm going, are you kidding me? And the night before he, before, humili- he humiliated him at the White House Correspondence yes. Dinner. That was like a, that was such a cinematic night for Barack oh. Obama. Oh, yes. Now, at the time, it didn't bother me so much. A lot of my more thoughtful friends were going, he shouldn't have been showboating so much. Or I said, well, he's entitled. Look, we have like eight years of that little twerp, George W. Bush, prancing around. But uh, 
But after a while, that did bother me, too, to the point was, I wonder what the hell really did happen there. And did it even matter? You know, what but, happened? Where what? What happened was because at that point, Osama bin Laden, there, remember, uh, who is the uh, the the prime minister of Pakistan? Mushar- um, Musharraf? No, the uh, the woman. Uh, uh, oh, Benazir Bhutto. Benazir, Benazir Bhutto. And she had been claiming for years. So we all know that bin Laden's been dead for years. I mean, she said that publicly, quoted many places and times. And uh, so, you know, you got to wonder. But the whole point is that's neither here nor there, whether or not. When did she die? Wasn't she dead already? She got assassinated. Yeah. I think she died before 2001. I think she might have been assassinated before that. But she had said before that that. But the point is, is that, you know, all of this, whether regardless of what happens, it's all presented, you know, like Hollywood style. It all presented with a very simpl- simplifying narrative, which is why, you know, the whole business of the bank failures is kind of dry and not so interesting because you get into the details of the bond market. And it's like, well, let, let me get let me get my arms around this because I, yeah. I want to talk about Putin before oh, we yes. before and the ICC. But before we do, I, I just want to clarify something about Afghanistan, because on the show, I think it was Monday, some people were surprised that I kept saying Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. I was very uncomfortable saying that, well, that, that, that I, I said that Barack Obama lied when he said in 2008 We took our eye off the ball. We shouldn't have invaded Iraq. Afghanistan is ground zero for terrorism. That's what he said, that Afghanistan was the good war. Iraq is the bad war. Most Americans think the Taliban assisted Osama bin Laden. And it to me, that is as it's to me, it says it's worse of a lie than Saddam Hussein and Iraq being behind 9-11, because that has been disproven. But the American, this is a stubborn lie that Americans believe. And as we were pulling out in 2021, Milley, the Joint Chiefs of Staff chair, kept saying, we have to keep an eye on Afghanistan. This is where terrorism is brewing. Am I misreading what I'm right. Am I right that Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11? Well, the Taliban certainly did not. Well, in general, the Afghan people just were suffering a huge civil war, uh, you know, for several generations and the country was torn apart. And it's under such circumstances of chaos, disorder, the lack of governance. Uh, failed state, as they used to call it. Failed state, you know, civil war torn apart in the in those ways. Uh, feudal lords, basically warlords, you know, controlling uh, territories and summary justice. And it was really out of that to uh, sense of, um, of uh, chaos um, Mm-hmm. that the Taliban actually emerged and managed to enforce some kind of draconian, though it may have been some kind of uh, sense of order uh, under their repression and control to put an end to most of the, you know, of the fighting. Um, it wasn't the Taliban government that had any ambitions or interests in um, global mayor, uh, affairs and in the U.S. role in any of this. They were an Afghan kind of national movement, a movement that emerged in those specific contexts. However, they did provide a uh, safe haven to uh, of a certain kind to al-Qaeda and that internationalist jihadist movement that had originally been sponsored uh, in um you know, the resistance to the Soviet invasion with Saudi money. The Mujahideen. Yeah, the Mujahideen and U.S. kind of, um, uh, you know, training and and armaments and um, intelligence and so on. Um, So 
they're different. You know, Al Qaeda is a transnational, um, you know, organization um, that happened to find a safe haven in Afghanistan as they had in Sudan for a period of time. They'd had, you know, operations and Mm -hmm. they found certain regimes and certain conditions uh, conducive to their operations of trying to mount, um, you know, attacks on the established military dictators governing Muslim states throughout the region. Um, But they were crushed in places like Egypt. They were forced out of there and they had to go back to places like Afghanistan because after, um, you know, the Afghan, the Soviet occupation and invasion of Afghanistan ended, uh, many of these people went back to their uh, countries or went to Chechnya or went to like, you know, so you had this kind of global dispersal. Um, mm-hmm. But they, it didn't really work. You know, they weren't capable of overturning their corrupt, per, you know, uh, um, governments at home. Um, and so many of them returned to uh, Afghanistan because it was a weak state and where they could, you know, they could have a base of operations. Um, it's when, then but- that they decided, OK, we're not able to topple these corrupt dictatorships in our own countries. Uh, because they're supported by the United States. They're armed and supported, and it's impossible for us to overthrow them. Um, so what we should do is try and, you know, uh, attack the far enemy and weaken that, right? So this was their kind of theory. I've got, the Taliban had no knowledge, I don't think, or interest in this kind of a strategic goal that fueled al-Qaeda's international terrorist agenda. Um and so the, the the association it was always um, characterized. The slippage was important, I think, of course. But in precise moments, um, the Taliban were targeted because they could be a target. I mean, mm-hmm. you could find them, you could you know demonize them, and um, because they had provided safe haven for the terrorists. So it was but, but understood that safe they weren't ha- the terrorists. What does safe haven no. mean? It mean to me it's was it Tora Bora where was he hiding out? Well, that's what's thought that initially uh was holed up in a complex underground kind of mountain complex in Tora Bora caves and so on. Um But I mean know, so yeah. what does that have to do so isn't it kind of like there's uh a militia in Idaho, that's planning an attack on another country, and our government is keeping an eye on it, but we can't stop Do it. too much about it. I mean, especially if you're a weak, you know, government that doesn't have really full authority. And um, isn't you know, that what uh, essentially what Al Qaeda is? I mean, to, to in, vis-a-vis Mullah Umar and the the the, the Taliban. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were. They, at, at, at certain points, um, the Taliban saw Al Qaeda as a threat because they did what they wanted. You know, they they <laughs> acted with, you know, impunity, and they were a bit of a problem if they were actually to control Afghanistan and uh, establish the kind of regime and, and territorial control that they envisioned for the Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, they were something of a political and military threat to the Taliban. So the, it for America, they didn't cooperate at certain times. They had a tense, sometimes collaborative relationship, but other times um, a tense one. And um, you know, this is the reason why there. You know, there are reports that um, you know Mullah Omar offered you know to kind of give uh, uh, Osama bin Laden up several times made this offer in the run-up to the U.S. In invasion. Right. Professor Marianne has brought that up several times yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the past. And I think al-Qaeda assisted in assassinating tribal, like, warlords. I think there was some kind of, But on is it safe to say that on 9-11, the Taliban were not dancing in the streets? Well, I don't. Uh, well, yes. I mean, there were the reports that supposedly they were dancing in the streets. I mean, that was very much overblown, apparently. Um, 
And even if it were true, it doesn't mean they were involved. Right. I mean, you know, I, and I, operationally engaged and did I mean, anything. You know, it's just that oh, like oh, the great superpower of the U.S. that is you know right. oppressive has suffered a, a, a blow. But in fact, actually, that wasn't even really the reaction. People were kind of shocked and mm-hmm. dismayed and 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 so on. Um, but it was you know characterized and portrayed in order to enlarge uh, the sense of responsibility to the Taliban and to Afghan society Mm -hmm. as a whole, um, because, you know, Al-Qaeda posed a very unique kind of um, threat, a a transnational uh, kind of secretive organization that um, the U.S. felt would be very difficult uh, to have a war against. And in fact, actually, they, they really didn't have a war against al-Qaeda. Um, and that's what the, the incredible missed opportunity. I mean, if you go back to this time, and something that Dr. Uh, Ariel Salzman and I discussed in the latest episode of The Mudgeless, Iraq 20 Years After. And so I encourage people to go listen to that. It's just out today um, or yesterday. No, I think today. Um, is that if you think about the atmosphere after 9-11, in the couple of months after 9-11, I mean, Russia, who's now the enemy number one, offered the use, you know, and sanctioned use of uh, military facilities, air bases, and so on in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, places like this. The world really rallied around yeah. the United States. Um, Even Iran, I understand. Yeah, even Iran. Exactly. Iran Iran. expressed great sympathy. And, um, you know, well, the the point of this is, is that the United States became a victim of one of its creations. Okay, so in the region, everybody knew and understood that these had served U.S. policy in the past, but then they had become a threat or a danger to regimes that the U.S. supported and sponsored, as well as ultimately after nine, as a consequence of 9-11, clearly, and also with some other attacks that had happened, U.S. Embassy, the Kenya, mm-hmm. you know, bombing, there was the, the destroyer coal yeah. in the Persian Gulf. So it now had turned into an anti-U.S., uh, you know, force, Al-Qaeda, um, but Iran had been against these extreme Sunni, you know, terrorists as well, because they hated Shias. They slaughtered the Hazara, you know, a Shi'i uh, community in Afghanistan. Similarly, a lot of these uh, governments like the Assad government, you know, uh, was also very helpful and instrumental in the U.S. global war on terror by um you know, uh, conducting a lot of uh, surveillance, capture of people, torturing of these jihadis, you know, on behalf of the United States in providing, you know, people who could speak the language and, you know, had practiced torture uh, for, you know, decades before and willing to do these sorts of things in America's, you know, global war on terror. Um And the reason why is because they saw these groups as threats as well. And this was never really communicated in the United States. They just had this kind of view of the Middle East and the Islamic world as being represented essentially by Osama bin Laden. Um, And those kinds of uh, associations uh, ended up creating the conditions where any invasion, whether it was invading Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, was possible if you associated them with terrorism and in particular with Al-Qaeda. So the biggest lie was, I think, not that they had WMDs uh, in Iraq, right? Because this was something that you could verify. Uh, You could have inspections. And this was the weakness of that kind of casus belli and rationale for war. It's like, well, well, then why don't we just do inspections? You know, the international community was eager to organize those. You've got Hans Blix. He's ready to go. Right. You know, so that was a process. Yeah, that was an uncomfortable, uh, you know, on, you know, process that couldn't be as controlled as they wanted because they wanted this war. They were planning this war, as Wesley Clark told us immediately after 9-11. They had a list of seven, nine countries or whatever that they were going to use this as an opportunity to hit, to topple these governments that were threatening of U.S., you know, geostrategic positions in the region and so on. So that wasn't actually the worst 
of the lies of the Bush administration. I think the worst lie was this intimation that Saddam Hussein had been a sponsor or collaborated with Al Qaeda um, in 9/11, and because that was emotionally going to be resonant with the right. American, you know, public who had already now proven that they would make the association. Uh, between the Taliban and Al Qaeda and not distinguish between these two groups in any way that was relevant. So now they tried it again. Why not? You know, the, it's proven possible to tar the Taliban who are easily tarred because they're not a very, you know, uh, you know, uh, they don't know how to present themselves they're in branding. the Western media. Let's just put it that way. You know, I mean, it was easy to see that this was um, you know, the persecution of women and so on. Like, So nobody was there to defend the Taliban, but you could make this association with them and justify a major, you know, invasion of Afghanistan. And they did basically the same thing. And I think that was much worse. It was much more effective um, you, because actually what they were good about doing, the Bush propagandists, the neocon propagandists, is suggesting that even if you couldn't find direct links, and even if it made no sense, you know, to uh, to associate an Arab Baathist nationalist regime with a jihadi, you know, Islamic uh, transnational group, a nation state and its nationalist ideology with a transnational uh, kind of organiz- terrorist organization. Um, if you were in doubt, you know, the problem with the WMDs is that, you know, as Condi Rice said, we don't want to wake up to a mushroom cloud, right? Because right. maybe Al-Qaeda will get it and they would, you know, try and use it. So even if Iraq is far away, even if, you know, it was under wraps because of a decade and a half of brutal sanctions after a war that had devastated its infrastructure, uh, nonetheless, What if there was some collaboration? This could lead Al Qaeda to get its hands. Like it wasn't that Iraq had its hands on WMDs. It was the association with Al Qaeda in the global war on terrorism. That lie is what made it um, effective to to talk about WMDs. And again, not because they wanted to go down the path of investigation investigation of those weapons programs through weapons inspections, but because it would play upon the same fears that allowed the U.S., you know, bombardment, invasion, and destruction of Afghanistan. Professor Marianne Cummings, how stupid was George W. Bush? And when you look at how he was able to get the war he wanted, how stupid was he? Um, I I think that's kind of unknowable. Um, The one thing I had to say about George W. Bush is he felt very comfortable wielding power. In a way that, like Al Gore didn't, Bernie Sanders does. I mean, there's almost apologies for from a lot of lefties, you know, for actually asserting power. Um, but it's interesting to contrast that attack on 9/11 with uh, an almost identical attack. Could have been worse. Three weeks after uh, uh, um, Bill Clinton was inaugurated. That was the first attack on the World Trade Center. That didn't go off as well. If that had gone off as planned, because I think there was some uh, explosives that didn't ignite, there would have been far more casualties because no one would have been able to escape that building. That would have come crashing down. What did the then uh, Bill Clinton's administration do? Well, they immediately assembled people who actually knew something in the in, in the intelligence agencies, Clinton who actually is a smart guy and was not on quite on board with the neocons at that point, uh, you know, just basically put, put people to work. They tracked them down. They regarded this as a criminal investigation mm-hmm. rather than a war. And within two years had the perps, you know, like arrested, had, you know, had them tried. They were able to find out who Osama bin Laden was like the blind sheik and all of his out. I mean, they were able to find through, like uh, traditional interrogations, not torture. And, uh, you know, so they were able to track these down. There was a certain tension between between Clinton and members of the State Department and the national security apparatus, which we would call neocons now, because they really wanted Clinton to be far more 
you know, aggressive. But Clinton didn't see this as a war. He saw this as a police action, as something that... And that's you know, what Kerry said in 2004. That this was a security problem. Right. A security problem, basically, of our own creation, as Ziggy, as the big new Brzezinski, you know, admitted on the Diane Reem show over 11 years ago, it was him that came up with the idea of, hey, in the, in the Carter administration of, hey, let's like, you know, cause havoc for the Soviets and, you know, just like start arming these uh, radicals in Afghanistan, which at that time had a moderate, if communist, or at least Soviet friendly government. And I, I'm sure Howie Klein could tell you what life was like. He'd travel, you know, you yeah. could... Women went to school, went to universities, and so on and so forth. So Clinton saw this as a national security. Now, what happened when uh, when Bush got elected? Like, literally, the national, I remember this, it was the National Security Report Directive from February of 2001, February 6th, I believe. And it basically re, completely reconfigured, it dismantled all of the interagency organizations that the uh that the Clinton administration had set up and routed everything through the uh, advisor to, uh, for national security, which would have been Condi Rice at the time. Right. So they basically, all the apparatus that were not only able to get the perps of the original World Trade Center attack, but thwart about five or six other major attacks because they had a coordinated real national security and, and intelligence network. All those were dismantled. Uh, Gee, almost like, you know, they kind of wanted to have something happen. Right. Which I knew at the start. I mean, I've always contended right from that very morning after it was pretty clear what happened that these MFers wanted this to happen. And, you know, because everybody's, you know, I had to be arguing forever about, you know, people like explosives in the World Trade Center. That was a controlled explosion. Yeah, let's 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 move on because. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I I wanted the point is, I just just wanted to put a point on it. It's just it's it's much about our evolution in our country as it is about anything happening in the Middle East, how we responded. I I, I hope I wasn't rude to you. I what I, I when you were when you brought up the controlled I thought you were going to go down the control. No, no, no. I, 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 I pushed against that. I said, look. Well, it's not even, I, I, I don't don't even want to bring up controlled demolition. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that there is something about these guys, let it happen on purpose, because I wondered why planes were making U-turns in the sky for two hours. I mean, like when a couple of years before Payne Stewart's plane had taken off from an obscure little airfield in Ocala, Florida, and within 20 minutes of losing contact with air traffic control, had an F-14 escorting it, ready to shoot it down, you know. Well, uh, I think it, I I don't think Republicans do governance. I think once you get a, but let me ask you about this. Yes. Since Joe Biden took uh, office and you, uh, Putin tried to take Ukraine, Joe Biden has been working feverishly behind the scenes to get our good friends over at the International Criminal Court to arrest Vladimir Putin because we're a nation of laws and there is now a a, a warrant for Vladimir Putin uh, to be arrested because America is a nation of international law. So that's a good thing, right? Go ICC, (laughs) right? What's the yeah, problem? Have to send a posse over. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's the problem? What is uh, Joe Biden leaving out of this? Uh, oh, I don't think we recognize the international oh, oh, okay. criminal court. Mm. And I don't think it's possible that we, we ever do, because if we did, all living presidents, possibly even Jimmy Carter, is going to be sent to The Hague. Well, but that's just the point, is that they w- probably won't. Right. Is yeah. that yeah, I think they, they worry that it's risky. You know, uh, it does expose U.S. Uh, officials and leaders. But the point is, is that these international organizations um, don't end up taking on the United States and the great, you know, the greatest of powers, you know, uh, in, 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 in the system. And in fact, actually, there was a recent interview with a very high level French 
diplomat who I think had even been something like ambassador to the United States and very big in the UN and various officials who had recently retired. And uh, I remember uh, Ben Norton on his uh, channel, uh, geopolitical uh, multipolarista, um, having an article and a video about this interview that he did. I don't remember the original interview, but it was quite stunning because he admitted so many things about how the world system and these international institutions at the UN actually work. Um, and it was partly in response to these kind of questions about um, global public opinion and the fact that the United States attempt to try and mobilize the world around these Russia sanctions and for its so-called rules-based order against authoritarianism, why this is not actually working so well uh, is because, you know, these institutions are really designed to uh, there's international institutions, but they're designed to reflect the will of, you know, UK, US, France, a uh, few key, you know, few key countries, Western, Western countries. Um, and so the thing is, is that they're not going to, uh, you know, charge US presidents. Uh, you know, Russia is actually not, has not signed on to the Rome statute uh, for the International Criminal Court either. Or China, China stopped them China issuing either. this yeah. warrant, right? Um, even though they don't recognize the court. I mean, Ukraine has, and so they can do it perhaps on Ukraine's uh, <laughs> behalf here. But it's yeah. very interesting to see, you know, Anthony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State, uh, today or yesterday encouraging all countries who are signatories to the ICC to enforce those provisions if Putin were to enter their jurisdiction, Right. Um, but apparently he could come to the United States and it would be fine. <laughs> so we're not right. parties to it either. Yeah. I was doing some research uh, about this and Mike Pompeo uh, froze the chief prosecutor's assets and took away her visa of the, f from the ICC. She was not allowed to come to the United Nations because she was looking into American war crimes. So uh, I'll. I'm, yeah, very interesting. I yeah. mean, um, she was stepping outside the rules based order, right? Mm hmm. Or the well, what's also interesting here is like the timing of this. I mean, it seems to me that the story about uh, and these charges and allegations of Russian, you know, quote unquote kidnapping, you know, in any case, trans. Supporting uh, people from a war zone in Ukraine uh, to the Russian Federation, and especially children, has received a lot of media of it, media attention uh, some months ago. Yes. Um, so those have not been put in the formal, uh, you know, uh, charges of the ICC and a warrant, um, you know, produced. From months ago, I wonder what is um, significant or valuable um, in doing so now? Is there something useful in the timing? Um, and I wonder if it does have something to do with the fact that a couple weeks ago, Xi Jinping and China put forward um, a kind of framework for negotiations and principles on which such negotiations and a, an ultimate peace should be concluded in the Ukraine situation. Um, and is now, you know, the premier of China is now visiting or just was visiting uh, Russia. And, um, you know, if this is a, um, intended to embarrass sort of Putin to scuttle uh, the potential and possibility of um, genuine negotiations being, you know, launched and uh, by uh, making this threat essentially against against Putin is definitely going to harden um, potentially his sort of willingness to negotiate because now you have to deal with these you know, charges and allegations, and that's that's out there in just the same way that um, annexing the Donbass was a move that, you know, definitely uh, 
puts pressure on the possibility of an easier pathway to negotiations. It just adds things that now are going to be a problem, uh, you know, to be dealt with. And I wonder if this may result from some concern that China was taking a pretty uh, serious role and a potentially effective role in resolving this dispute. I mean, Zelensky himself said at the time that he would be, he rejected, of course, uh, some of the presumptions and the idea that, um, you know, uh, any territory should be ceded. But of course, that's exactly what you would negotiate. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're actually interested in negotiating, you don't make that uh, criteria from the outset to have negotiations. He did express, however, interest in China's involvement and in that he would like to present the case, uh, Ukraine's case, to Xi Jinping. And I said at the time when I first remarked on that, that I don't think the United States really appreciated uh, Zelensky indicating that he was open to some kind of talks and discussions with Xi Jinping, because I think the United States is concerned and nervous about uh, losing, you know, control of, 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 uh, you know, of the situation by uh, a peace being negotiated, particularly not by the United States. And because it's clear that China is starting to play a major geopolitical role. One thing that we haven't commented on is the fact that after I think it was seven or eight years of no diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, that China also just very recently, just last week, announced in Beijing uh, that it had brokered um, a uh, peace deal or at least a kind of formal recognition um, with you know various other issues uh, being on the table uh, that is is going to allow uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran to have diplomatic relations. It doesn't mean that it's suddenly peace has broken out in the Middle East, but it does mean that the situation has improved rather dramatically, and that the whole crux of U.S. policy in the region, which has been to have an axis of pro-U.S. Uh, Sunni and try and frame it, you know, within and, you know, uh, exploit fears about religious sectarian identity, about the Shia crescent, because uh, Iran has its affiliates in Syria with a friendly government of the Assad government and, uh, you know, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen. This may be a pathway. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy uh, or follow naturally, but that there may be a pathway for resolving some of these ongoing uh, problems, including the horrible uh, catastrophe that is the Saudi invasion and occupation in Yemen and the civil war that's been raging there as a result. So, you know, this is a stunning uh, yeah. development. Uh, and I, and and it happened think- without the U.S. knowing that it really that right. it was going on. And it well, goes because. What else goes on in the world except for what the U.S. does, right? Now, well, yeah, yeah, and all, and, saying, and I also, have not seen any discussion about the uh, the nuclear aspect of this. But I yeah. am just willing to bet that there was no way that the Saudis went went into this um, agreement or you know had re- reestablished diplomatic relations without Iran agreeing to not further its nuclear weapons. R&D. Well, that's I mean, unknown. Yeah, that's that is unknown. But I am I, I know I have been trying to find anything about this, but I am willing to bet that, you know, uh, under the radar, Iran has probably has probably made quiet agreements with the Saudis that they will not pursue their nuclear weapons. Well, I hope that's the case. That I, would I, mean, I would beneficial. almost guarantee that that would have to be the case. The well, unless the, unless it is that they will share technology oh, with the Saudis, oh, who also are interested in developing and proliferating. Yeah, I don't think world. Iranians want to do that. Do you? But let's hope it's that, not that. But so but I, I think th- that the two major issues out there get dealt with: the the war in Yemen and the um, nuclear agreement, the, mm-hmm. you know, the halt on nuclear proliferation by Iran, and it will be dealt with in a way that I think will be much more stable than anything that the U.S. has been able to come up with. 
I rather suspect you're right. And I think that if Iran, uh, that if China is a guarantor, they will be seen as a more reliable, stable, mm-hmm. predictable, um, you know, guarantor and sponsor of this, of, of some kind of uh, a- agreement. Um, they're <clears throat> going to be more trusted. That's the problem. The United States is no longer trusted in the region. And it's not seen as a reliable, you know, ally. Um, Talk to me about TikTok. They're even... They're even joking oh, in talk. like, you know, today is the first day of Ramadan. Um, and oh. uh, the joke, uh, you know, in kind of the Muslim world is that this is the first year and anyone can remember where Iran and Saudi agreed on the start of Ramadan because, you know, it involves the lunar calendar. It oh, has to be determined. <laughs> and every time Saudis would announce, OK, this is the first day of Ramadan, Iran would say, nope, not the first day. Tomorrow is the first day. And. You know, so people are joking that, you know, uh, we can thank China for yeah. getting them to agree on, you know. Uh, Unfortunately, it's now called of- the year of the dog. But other than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think this is very interesting, you know, to think about the China's growing role that hasn't, you know, um, happened as a result of it wielding military might in the region um, or exercising security Interest, but through peaceful negotiation, sponsoring uh, these kinds of talks uh, that had actually been ongoing. I mean, one of the thing, one of the problems with the, uh, and in fact, perhaps one of the motives for the assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani in Iraq is that he was actually there to meet with Saudi officials uh, as part of an ongoing dialogue to try and resolve, or at least, you know established diplomatic relations. Um, But the point is, is that, you know, China is a huge partner, trading partner with both those two countries, and it relies very substantially on, uh, you know, importing energy from the Gulf, uh, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia. Um, You know, the oil doesn't really matter that much to the United States. The U.S. is one of the biggest producers of both natural gas and oil. But it wants to control, uh, you know, the oil market and those resources, and to have. It isn't about the oil. You're you're right. It's about the petrodollar. It is, and 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 that's the other thing that's happening is that I believe Iran has agreed to to sell um, its oil to China using the renminbi, and not. Uh, the dollar. Obviously, it's very difficult for Iran because of the extreme sanctions that are on it. Uh, but it, it's clear that Saudi has shown some willingness to consider also abandoning the you know petrodollar. Um, so that would be very dramatic for the you know status of the U.S. Um, you know U.S. economic uh, hegemony and all of the benefits that have come from uh, having the reserve currency, you know, in the world. Um, But so this, what this feeds into, though, is the fact that China is emerging as a major geo, you know, political force, um, because of its trade, because of its um, approach to development that has, you know, uh, you know, people argue that there are problems with the way China's you know, Belt and Road Initiative is conducted and so on. But the point is, is that it has proven popular as an alternative, as a potential alternative. Everybody seems to want alternatives. They don't want to be coerced into a with you're with us or against us uh, kind of so-called rules-based order. Um, and um, this is fueling, I think, real panic um, and hostility in the United States. So, you know, there might be balloons flying over, uh, you know, weather balloons, spy balloons. And now, you know, there are congressional hearings about the dangers of uh, social media companies controlled by China, namely TikTok and its um, subordination to Chinese intelligence services. I mean, where was, you know, this outrage in Congress over all of the revelations that we've had, Mm -hmm. you know, from Edward Snowden and others about, you know, uh, Facebook and, uh, you know, all of, and I guess we have had the Twitter files, I suppose. You could say that that has been one element that is similar in this, Uh, but there's nothing like the same kind of panic. 
and its bipartisan panic about uh, the influence of Chinese technology uh, companies, social media companies, and um, what they could do with that data and the fact that they will have links potentially to intelligence services. Um, this is, I think, a really important part of um, you know this new Cold War that we're in. Um, and I see this as extremely dangerous, uh, whereas what China did is actually very good for the region and it's very good for the world uh, to try and sponsor peace talks. Right, right. Well, speaking of petrodollars and other uh, things that are as obscure to me as particle physics, let's <laughs> ask a particle physicist to talk about the bank bailouts. Okay. Well, you know, the only thing I can say about my qualifications were in regards economics and finance is I know what it isn't. And what it is not is physics. <laughs> it is not, a, you know, it is not a hard, it is not a science like physics is as much as the economists as I, I remember the term physics envy about from about 20 years ago was kind of something that uh, was ascribed to economists. Um, maybe you know, some hard science with brain chemistry, but you know, the, the bottom line, and I, I would really get, uh, would really urge people to read Jack Rasmus's uh, article in Counterpunch from yesterday, Banking Crisis 2023. There's a deep or origins and future directions. So he talks about the three levels, you know, of, of this crisis, you know, the precipitating part, the enabling part, but then the fundamental part. And yes, the, the precipitating one was this, this massive liquidity just recently from the, uh, the, the CARES Act and the COVID bailouts. And, you know, they were just flooding the banks with money that weren't in a crisis at that time. So what do you do with all this liquidity? Do you have like a FDR type program that you would start doing massive work in public health? You know, do you have a new, do you use that to accelerate uh, Medicare for all? Do you, you know, you could have done anything which would have resulted in a real economy, but you didn't. You just had money, free money that was just looking for investments, you know, and, uh, and in, particular, you know, nobody asked why so many millionaires and billionaires were created during COVID. And it was because of a lot of this speculative financing. And one and this SBB is was probably the poster child, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a whole lot of other banks doing the same thing. You had startups, you had all this angel type investment in, in so-called new technologies, technologies like that may never be brought to market, but this is what happens when you have, you know, a when you have a pile of money sloshing around, and people want to make money off of that money, instead of like building up your communities, you know, instead of doing major public works. Because after COVID, I mean, small businesses were decimated. There was, you know, there there was just literally millions and millions of people that needed to be helped. If you could have just gone to work with green energy projects and uh, ventilation, just the upgrade of the HVAC system on every single public and governmental building in the United States, that would have been a real economy. Mm -hmm. That would have been real businesses. That would have been real manufacturing. That would have been real R&D, but they didn't do that. And, you know, so I, I was looking at, I, I don't want to, go explaining this because I don't think there's much to explain when you're talking about speculation. The scams can be incredibly intricate, but the bottom line is the same. It's the same kind of investment instruments that would allow uh, a, a countrywide mortgage company like 15 years earlier to have a $64 trillion exposure in the market. You know, when you've got these financial instruments that are so complicated and so redundant and, and, and opaque and hard to understand, the underlying, what underlies it, you know, they blamed it on poor people getting houses. 
It doesn't matter if it's metals, mortgages, or even frickin' tulip bulbs. We know that when you have these, what, what, I can see, what I consider just finance capital. So, you know, I think I want to connect it to the current situation of the world. We've got a whole bunch of people in the distinct department that thought finance, insurance, real estate, that the GDP based on that is a real economy. Mm-hmm. And that these, you know, these sanctions that would hit Russia, power would just devastate their economy, collapse the ruble. And then they discover that actually real economies have real resiliency. I mean, Putin has been ever since he was he took over from the Yeltsin years, he was building up Russia. I mean, he modernized the agricultural sector. He had an industrial policy. There was another paper that I just wrote about wrote it. Made, written in 2018 about reindustrialization in Russia, which meant an industrial policy, which means a massive innovation or at least regulation of your economy by the government, something that neolibs are loath to do. But it results in an economy that can actually scale up for a war, for instance. Um, this is a very, very big topic, but uh, I have been reading for quite a while. Pepe Escobar writes about these things in the Asia Times. He talked years ago about the collapse of uh, the the collapse of the Boeing seven thirty seven. It was this you know, they it was this new airline that Boeing had won over contracts against Airbus because you know Air, hey it's Boeing and that. It was just plagued with all kinds of, you know, technical problems and and production problems. And it kind of revealed an industry, which is, you know, aeronautics is one of U.S.'s core competencies was supposed to be aeronautics. And they find that as a result of, you know, hyper financialization, uh, you know, finance driving everything, you know, they they didn't invest enough in their R&D, in their engineering staff, in their real capabilities, um, these just-in-time kind of global production schemes that at every point in the chain was, was designed to maximize profit and efficiency. And they found out that they had a disaster on their hands. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, um, so what do the people of the world really need? Everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs energy. And, you know, uh, Russia has basically deprivatized its military, has based, has built up over the years a real industrial policies. It's internalized, it brought back into the country most of its supply chains. Every step of this, of course, would be considered inefficient by people with a Western mindset. But for somebody running a country, for a country that... Is trying to build up resilience against external forces and, ex- and an external rating. It makes all this. It, it makes a world of sense. And now we see the fallout from that. Um, Andrew Basovich, which I believe you've had on your show, yes, yes, he he goes at it from another direction, but basically he comes to the same conclusion that there is just something inextricably linked with our rabid consumerism. And the resource wars that, you know, we've just been doing in lieu of a real diplomatic based foreign policy. And when you have these this rapaciousness that, you know, this we always have to we always have to be growing. That profit has to be maximized. Well, people play these scams because individually they want to maximize their own money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And when you don't have and, and unfortunately, as any of us know we I grew up playing Monopoly, you know, <laughs> it ends up being two players and then one player. And it, it it's just so, so all of these, what I liked about Andrew Basovich was in a very, you know, very analytical way showed that, you know, because we do not seem to connect our foreign policy with our domestic consumerism, but it is just intricately wound up in that. And if you, you know, if you don't have a concern for the world or the things that, you know, that that we just take for granted and toss away, 
um, America was insulated for a long time. We had the luxury of this kind of ignorance. Yes. And I think people are going to be in for a very, it, it's going to be, I think, kind of disconcerting and disorienting for a lot of people to hack to face the reality that we're a declining empire. I think most people are in decline, so it won't, the idea that America is <laughs> From in decline. From the time we're born, we're dying. Yeah, yeah, but I think most Americans are not part of whatever this empire, uh, this, you know, the, whatever benefits accrue from being an empire, I think most Americans don't feel, they don't feel. No, it. we don't. I, I think that is true. And so that's I, when people ask, tell ask me why I'm so anti-American is that I'm not an anti-American. I am anti-oligarchs that have, you know, what was that term that Matt Taibbi came up with? Vampire squid. Yeah. Um, talking about the financialization of our economy. I mean, yeah, to be continued. Professor Marianne Cummings, thank you so much. Particle okay. physicist and follow her on Twitter at uh, Razor Girl is her handle. You're the Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois. Thank you. Professor Adnan Hussein, Chairman of the Religion Department over at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, host of Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast. Did you say Professor Saltzman is on the Mudgeless? Yeah, that's right. My friend and colleague and former guest on the show, yes, yes. Dr. Ariel Saltzman. Um, oh, okay. She joined me to talk about Iraq after 20 years. Um, and uh, that episode is out. M-A-J-L-I-S. You can get it on all the platforms. And who's on Guerrilla History? Uh, Guerrilla History, we have had quite a number of, you know, uh, interesting people recently. Um, uh, I don't know who's coming out uh, t tomorrow or today, whenever this, this comes out. But most recently, we had uh, Greg Shupak talking about sanctions on Syria as part of our sanctions as war series. Uh, we also have one on sanctions uh, in Iraq. Uh, so you, people might be interested in that given the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion. Um, and, um, you know, we also are recording on Yemen sanctions and the situation in, in Yemen uh, tomorrow. So that should be out within a week or so as well. Um, so do check out Guerrilla History. A lot of good content there, too. Right. And moving forward, uh, I, I really want to get Americans to understand that. What did we do? 20 years in Afghanistan? 2021 is when we left. Yeah. Uh, I want. I mean, that, of course, is after our involvement earlier during the Soviet invasion right. occupation with the proxy war. So to get Americans to understand that they had nothing to do with 9-11. And if that's true, what does that mean? If Afghanistan was not the good war that Kerry and Obama both said, what does that mean? To me, that is the most underreported story uh, of the 21st century. I'm starting. I would have to agree with you because uh, that's the war that authorized the whole global war on terrorism. Um, when, as uh, Professor Marianne was mentioning, um, previous responses that proved to be relatively effective. Obviously, it didn't prevent 9-11 during the Clinton administration, but he was well, I did, if they were still in power. I will give yeah. that to the Maybe Clinton. they would have, yeah. Maybe if, they would have been Al Gore to connect the charge, dots. As, he would not have dismantled that anti-terrorist intelligence network. We might can have certainly been say that he wouldn't have been reading uh, My Friend the Goat or whatever it was that book yeah. <laughs> was. But yeah, there, there, there might My have been- My Pet Scapegoat, I believe is the- That's right, Scapegoat, yeah. And I believe that's yeah. called Ring Composition. We got, we we started on Scapegoat and we mm -hmm. end with- and we end up very we end. My Pet Goat, yes. My and, Pet uh, Scapegoat. But I think it goes back to that point that- there could have been a very different response and you could have actually perhaps mobilized wor the world that was ready and willing mm -hmm. to cooperate to uh, suppressing and bringing to justice and trying 
um, you know, in a, and it would have been a very different world. And maybe that would have brought out the potential and the goodwill for the kind of collaboration and cooperation that the world desperately needs to solve its genuine problems of climate change, of global inequality, uh, and forging a genuinely fair international system. We abandoned that potential path. We did so after the Cold War. We did so after uh, 9-11. We have not, we've never failed, it seems, to, you know, reject the opportunity, fail to take the opportunity to, you know, fail to take an opportunity. So um, I think it, looking back in 20 years is very sobering to see how much ground has been lost, how much money has been wasted, how much goodwill has been uh, frittered away. And instead, we are talking about this very polarized world. Um. Great. Thank you both. Thank you both. Here we go. Dr. Harriet Fraud joins us. She's a brilliant, brilliant psychotherapist. You can hear her. Her podcast is Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. And every Tuesday night at 630, WBAI here in New York. And interpersonal we'll, update. It's interpersonal cool. update. So I was saying before we started, not to traffic in stereotypes about people of my cloth, but it is a miracle <laughs> that I can look at the soundboard and the equipment and figure out why something is working and <laughs> why something. The way I was raised, this was not, I wasn't supposed to be able to figure this stuff out, uh, but I, I can. Dr. Harrod, for a lot, of, lot to go over, the shooting at the Christian school in Nashville, the child labor situation, we're finding out that 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds are cleaning saws. 12-year-olds cleaning saws. Middle saw. school, they're recruiting them from middle school. And 85,000 of migrant children have just disappeared from the radar because they just want to get them out of the shelters and save money for a change. But let's start on something a little upbeat. We're seeing massive strikes in France, Germany, Israel. What are they doing right? And what are we doing wrong? I, I read presidents of universities in Israel are standing up to Netanyahu and they're closing the schools. In, in America, it's the students who demand the schools get closed. But even the, the presidents of universities say, F this, we're we're marching. Right. And the professors, too, and the daycare workers in France, too. You know, the schools, although here schools have been pretty courageous. In L.A., the reason, <clears throat> the reason that the non-teaching faculty and, you know, the janitors, the custodians. Special the ed. My son, aides, my, my well, son, I may, my son is a strike captain. Special ed. All of them. Yeah. He, the teachers supported all the other school workers and threatened to strike as well, and they won. They got a 30% increase in all the school personnel that are not teaching personnel, which is amazing because they all hung together, whether it was the custodian or the teacher's aide or the tutor, and they all hung together in solidarity with the teachers. It just shows Labor solidarity wins. Yeah. That's what's happening in France. By yeah. the way, California, I don't like Newsom. Anybody who was married to Kimberly Gargoyle, I don't trust. Anybody who's a product of the San Francisco Democratic political machine that's given us Nancy Pelosi and our vice mm -hmm. president, I don't trust. And he had an opportunity for single payer. He didn't come through with that. But, but. they're going to produce their own insulin in California. Yep. And they're going to have full abortion rights and help people get abortions in California. And they're going to make that abortion pill free. And they're going to do a whole lot of other things that are very progressive. Right. Adds, know, new, adds, new meaning to, adds new meaning to California, here I come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <It's>, exactly. <laughs> really. Uh, so – Protesting in France, how do you see this? Do you think Macron is going to reverse his well, decision? No, I don't think so. Because, look, France guarantees a pension for every worker. 
they won that through their labor militancy. You have to work for 30 years and earn it. And he wants to say, okay, too bad. You have to work. You work 30 years. Well, now you have to work 32 and you still don't get the money. And we'll get the interest on the money we took out of your salary. Whoa. They had enough. And I think that the French have a tradition from the French Revolution on of protest. And the way I understand that is a couple of ways. One is they have choices in their electoral system. They have, they could choose a monarchist. They could use a capitalist. They could choose a communist. They could choose a socialist. They could choose a fascist. They actually have choices. Plus, they don't allow any money in the, in elections. So you don't get the best, best democracy money can buy. And you don't just have two billionaires or two people who can get billions in um, financing running against each other and paying back whoever financed them to get in. They have a much less corrupted system. Plus, I also think that since they have universal quality daycare for three-year-olds, kids grow up with the same group. They can be in daycare from 7.30 in the morning to 7.30 at night, and they go home with a clean outfit and all their meals. They don't all do that, of course, but that's an option. And so kids grow up with their peer group. When I was in France, I remember being at a store and this three-year-old was just about the height of some breads in a basket and he mm. was chewing on all the breads, <laughs> just gnawing on them at his level. And his mother, because they're you know, not all that sweet to their kids, his mother hit him. A few minutes later, he started gnawing again, you know, that... Right. They have much more solidarity with their peers that they grow up with than American kids who are trapped at home with these two giants who gave birth to them right. and who are omnipotent. And, and also socioeconomically, they mingle more among classes. I think it was you who told me that in order to build an apartment building, even if it's high income, there has to be low income ha apartments in that building. Not only that, every company has to have on its board local people who will be affected if it closed or expanded and have to comment on the ecology of the production there. And they also have to have a certain proportion of their board be union members. So they're not going to elect to send their jobs away. And in any case, it's illegal in France. You can't outsource Right. And so people have real investment in their jobs and they have much more control. Right. Plus, they have very powerful unions. No union official can ever be paid more than the highest paid of member of their union. So they don't have some people at the top who are bureaucrats making six figure salaries, while the people that are that they're supposed to represent don't make half that. And you have, you know, you you have to have representation and you can recall people. There is much more democracy in their union movement and they're not allowed to, to have such pay disparities. And so that they have much more representative unions that are, and their unions are organized according to parties. So the, the transportation union is a communist union. The energy union is a communist union. Other Unions are organized along Christian democratic lines or socialist lines, but they're ideological. What worker power you want to have rather than not. And in the United States, in the 50s, they kicked the whole left out of the union, smeared them with an anti-communist brush and lost the whole spark of the union. Right. So in 1970, you had 35 percent, a little more than a th one out of three workers was in the union and you had much more income in the income equality here. And now there's between seven and 9%. You can't kick the left out. They believe in workers. Right. And right. So they fell for the anti-communist stuff and they're weak in the United States. In France, they're very powerful. And in Germany too. Right. And That's in Germany, what happened, like in France, the Marshall Plan discouraged anyone from allowing, there no communists were allowed in the to teach in the university if they accept if 
their uh, university accepted Marshall Plan money, which they all needed because they were absolutely decimated after World War II, so that the PhD communists and socialists went into the labor movement and made these wildly powerful labor movements, which are now, you know, I'm fond of saying how a couple of years ago they had the 300,000 metal workers on strike in Germany, and they won, and they won a 22-hour work week with the same pay because they needed more work-life balance. Whoa, big big difference. And those are all differences between and they, them. And-, and they live five years longer than Americans do in France. I remember That's going. Right. To, I remember going to a party in the Hollywood Hills with Democrats, you know, Hillary Democrats. This must have been ten years ago. And somebody said, "Oh, the French are so much better because of their. Uh, they mandate that all new homes, new, all new luxury apartments, have to have low income housing, and that's so great for low income kids to be exposed." to kids who have privilege. And I, I'm looking at your face right now, and I said what you're thinking, which is, I look at your kids, they would, they're the ones who would benefit exactly from and living with low-income kids, not the other way around. All kids benefit from differences between them. And in, they're not allowed to do what they've done in New York, where they have to, where they get big tax breaks for adding affordable units, which they did on the Upper West Side. They had a separate entrance for the crap apartments for the that were less affordable. They couldn't use the pool. They couldn't use the regular lobby. And so you have segregated lower quality housing that you've included with a huge tax write off for affordable housing because there's no inspection here. You know. No. Uh, being somewhat funny here, if I were rich, I can understand not wanting to, at a certain age, just wanting to be around other rich people so I don't have to feel guilty and I can be left alone. But I would, my kids, the idea of, that is, that is, I'm joking around about not wanting to be around, but I understand why billionaires want to be around billionaires, but it's child abuse to raise your kids in that bubble with no life experience, it never ends well to just have them be only exposed to other rich kids does not end well for them. No, also they need to know how to get along with all sorts of people. And also the kids from a less prosperous home can benefit because they get to know parents and then the parents can give them some options, help them with school getting into a college or something like that. When America was less cl- class segregated, there was it was a much more democratic country. There's a book by Robert Putnam about that, about what it has happened with the racial and income segregation is that kids who used to benefit because parents would help who were more educated don't get those benefits anymore. Right, right. They're federalized. Well, let's talk about Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. A very tragic shooting today. Some details are coming out that are make it even more uncomfortable. I don't know if we want to touch on some of the details, but it was a, I believe it was a Christian school. Yes, it was three, a private three, Christian school. Three kids dead, three adults dead, two assault weapons and a pistol in Nashville, Tennessee, which has more anti-LGBTQ laws than any other state in America. They're so busy worrying about transgender people using your child's bathroom. But the gun laws, nothing. And look, 159, there have been 159 mass shootings. Three months aren't even over with yet. Right. And a mass shooting means that more than four people are shot and some are dead. So, wow, what are we talking about? The unusual thing here is it was a woman, and they shot her dead uh, when they got there. They're not going to find out why she did it by just shooting her in the knees or with a tranquilizer gun, which would make sense because you could find out what were you doing. But also, 
shootings, which are so frequent here, are 98% male. And in the other cases where women were involved, they were accomplices with their boyfriend. So this is also a unique case in that a woman was involved. We don't know what her problem was with the kids and teachers at that Christian school. And we'll never know because the idea of just going in and killing her is not useful. You have to find out what she was doing, why she was killing people and children. And it means that, you know, I remember reading that elementary school parents, one of their fears, 50% of them are afraid that their kid will get shot at school. Right. Because there have been enough school shootings that you're really scared, like Uvalde, you know, that's 22 kids dead, that it's so out of control and people are so angry and so armed and the corruption is so obvious. You know, the one bill that Santos, um, the notorious liar, sponsored was making the AR-15 automatic rifle the all-American gun. Well, okay, you know, the place is really breaking down. When you have a district attorney investigating Trump and then you have threats and pictures of the ex-president threatening Alvin Bragg with a baseball bat. Wow, that's what we've come to? There we are in Ukraine saying we are the democratic force. It doesn't look very good. And there, are, I couldn't get over that this is the 159th shooting right. so far. And there's only three months. Just, we haven't even finished the third month of the year. Right. How important is Trump to you? Is it a story that you obsess on, delight in? Do you fear Trump? Are you amused by him? I'm horrified by him because it shows the appeal of fascism in the United States, that people's cynicism and rage is so great that they just want to destroy, destroy the law, destroy the presidential office, destroy our trust in government, and that he is obviously an outlaw and they want to destroy lest he get caught and jailed like anybody else who's done those things. We're not like anybody else. Rich people have a much easier time and he's been committing crimes for years, but still it's, it would be very important even on the sex abuse stuff. The, the big cases that they've gotten have been two black guys and a Jew Weinstein and um, what's his name? Cosby. Jeffrey Epstein. Co well, that's another Cosby. One. Cosby. Jeffrey Epstein. Mm -hmm. Weinstein, right. Epstein, Cosby. Right. And um, who am I missing? R. Kelly. Who? R. R. Kelly. Kelly. Right. Black. Yeah. And that of the whole monstrous Epstein rapes, they killed him. But Jelen is the only one in jail, the woman. Right. And Les Staley, president of Barclays Bank, he did lose his job as president of the bank when this all came out. Aaron Black didn't lose his job as head of the global financial management. Alan Dershowitz is still there. The Les, Mo Les Moonves, the chairman of CBS, had to step down. He was deprived his, you his know, job, his big job, but and his big bonus, which suggests that an internal investigation shows that he is a rapist. And yet right. Because he was the head of CBS, he was able to tamp down the – there's evidence now that he was tamping down these police reports. That's right. And the same thing with Roger Ailes. That mm -hmm. they, I'm glad they do catch the people. I'm glad Weinstein is in jail. And I'm glad that Jelen Maxwell is in jail. And that Cosby and R. Kelly are in jail. But well, it Cosby was released on technicality. Yes. But he was in jail for a bit. But yeah. the ones that only the only ones that end up in jail are Jews and black people and women. Right. It's, you know, that's that's also indicative of what's happening. Right. And since Trump is neither, there's a lot of talk about, you know, people letting him off, which would be a disgrace, a national disgrace. The whole conversation is a national disgrace. And the fact he has that it's even the fact that he has been 
that he hasn't been arrested yet, not just by Alvin Bragg, but by anybody going back. He should have been arrested 40 years ago. Of course he should have, for real estate fraud. Yeah. And also that his wife suddenly fell down the stairs a month before her non-disclosure contract was over. His ex-wife, Ivana, and is buried in a nondescript cemetery, not a, even a cemetery. She has a little tiny plot in one of his golf courses. Whoa, that sort of smelled. Suddenly she fell down the stairs. Nobody I didn't know that her non-disclosure agreement expired. It was about to expire in a month or two. And she had said during the divorce that he raped her. That's right. And she was about to expire on her non-disclosure course, and he probably made her expire early. That there is, you know, nobody looks into these things. Nobody has looked into the 85,000 migrant children that are missing from the records. Right. That have been sent out to work in factories and be exploited and have their money taken and be sexually abused. Because it's cheaper to just let them go. And there's no accountability at the top. The it's, thing, the thing that People need to understand. I think you understand the abject cruelty, venality of these people. I was reading about the separation of the migrant kids from their parents when right. Jeff Sessions was the attorney general. He ordered it. Donald Trump demanded it. They delighted in it. They they it's acted true. as though it was a mistake, that it was done initially during the Obama administration. That when the reaction, when everybody was so horrified by it, they all said in the Trump administration, yes, well, you know, change the law and we won't do this. And yes, it is appalling, but they wanted it. They delight it. They delight in the cruelty. And we can't understand that. We don't understand how it's much. Fascistic. It is, it's fascistic to, to do that to people. And, you know, 85,000 children are missing. And those are a lot of them are children who came alone because their parents would be sent back. And then they're immediately exploited. Middle school children are the most exploited. The New York Times has a whole set of articles that are very good on child labor. But middle school kids, that's 12, 13, 14 year old kids are working all night in factories. In fact, the whole English speaking program in some of these schools works after school in full-time jobs, often in dangerous areas like packing. And what's sad is some of them are packing health bars for people who are conscious about the environment and their health. What? And they're stuffing them in and, um, packages as the conveyor belt goes on, and if the air gets that they get scalped, and they get injuries, and they disappear. But someone's making a lot of money. And this, is go children. this goes back to... Conservatism uh, to the French Revolution. They they believed conservatives, the Buckleys, they all believe that there are two classes, three classes, four classes of people, and certain children are never going to move up. They might as well work and support their families who also aren't going to move up. They have no problem with that, do they? No, they don't. These these are children who were so courageous. They came themselves and crossed the border. You know, these are unusually courageous children leaving their language and their families in order to have a better life and support their parents. And they're so, slain, practically. Let me ask you about the people who show up for the Trump rally in Waco, the deplorables. Yeah. If you were to sit one down and explain to them what fascism is. Because they they are convinced that they're anti-fascist, that they're not Nazis. They would never accept that label. Could you explain to them individually, not in a group, that what they believe, that they are crypto, proto, typical Nazis, that you that you are capable of doing or, or acquiescing to everything Mussolini and Hitler did. 
Could they ever understand that? I don't think they could understand it intellectually, because if you say fascism is when there's only one way that you can be, where you can live, where you can worship, they all believe that. And they believe in authoritarianism and obeying the leader. The way you would get them to turn around is just letting them talk about their childhood and how they feel and why they're in that cult. And just letting them talk and listening. And I've had that experience with somebody who was not in the wacko cult, as I call it, but who, who really hated foreigners. And I just listened to him talk for a couple of hours about all his feelings about it. By the time he finished, he wasn't so angry. You know, I tried with a couple of people to really patiently walk them through it. And eventually it comes down to their rage and their anger and some unresolved trauma. From, you just see it in their eyes. They won't say, you know, mommy touched me or didn't toilet train me properly. You could, but you could just see that something happened, it's unresolved, and it comes out through their politics and other things. You know, we see the people who Trump surrounds himself with, they're all serial uh, rapists or ch either child abusers. Or, yeah. yeah. Thieves. Yeah. But I think that what it isn't one thing or another. First of all, they aren't taught, as Trump wasn't, that there are consequences to their actions. Trump was spoiled rotten. He never had to pay the consequences for robbing his family of their money, of robbing his brother, of his inheritance. And so they're not brought up with the consequences of their actions. But also they're very angry because they feel cheated. And they have been often. But they haven't worked it through and they want to blame somebody rather than resolve it and look at their own feelings. So often if they got a long enough time to find their own feelings and talk, they might give their twisted ideas up. And they also feel like they're belonging to something. They can scream together. They have other people that hate too. And they make a mythological America, which they're gonna try to have be great again. It was never that great. Right. It was better if you were in a family led by a, a white male. You used to be able to earn a family wage in 1970 when we were the most egalitarian nation in the Western world. Now we're the least of all the developed countries, all 29 of them. But, uh, you know, you'd have to talk to them a long time. And I know when Arlie Hochschild was doing one of her interviews in Louisiana, about a guy who was supporting Trump. She asked, do you really think he'd bring your industrial job back? And the guy said, no, he's not going to do that. But he does, he does express my anger. And people are angry. Bernie Sanders right. expressed their anger too. But the Democrats knifed him in the back so he couldn't be a candidate, you know? Right. And they are angry for a good reason, but they can't affirm anything. They can only destroy. Their whole program is against. Right. They have no positive proposals to build the country. The Trump goes away. You see DeSantis. Do you delight in the, the notion that Trump is going to de destroy DeSantis? I mean, I kind of, I've been reading the polls and I've been reading about Trump accusing of him of being a child molester. And I'm thinking, oh, Go get him, Donald, like the way you did with Jeb Bush. Just get him. Are you delighting in that? I am. I, I am glad. You know, it's the falling out among thieves, accusing uh -huh. them. And in the falling out among thieves, epithets are traded that are true about each of them. And I think, look, DeSantis is more cautious because the majority of the voters in that party, the biggest block is Trump supporters. And so nobody wants to offend, even though Tucker Carlson hates him and Hannity hates him. It doesn't matter. Nobody wants to offend because he has the votes. These are you what know? bullies do. Bullies, real genuine bullies don't yes. stand up to people who are bigger bullies than they are. That's right. And that's just what 
DeSantis is. He's a sort of imitation bully. Right. And he's, you know, he, he, they call him Little D on uh, the Internet. Mm -hmm. D standing for D, as well as DeSantis. I mean, he is a twerp copying fascistic policies. And right. so I'm glad to see him put down. I'm glad to see all of those people put down. I remember, you know, Carl Hyacin, who writes those yeah, wonderful yeah, 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 yeah. Logical mysteries. Yeah. He said on the radio that he'd never been to an inauguration. So Jeb Bush invited him to Jeb Bush's inauguration as governor. And he wrote back and published his response, his RSVP, which is, your inauguration is on Wednesdays. I do my lawn on Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> it is no small achievement that Donald Trump destroyed the Bush name in 2016. He so, did. It's the falling out among thieves. Yeah. We're all accusing each other, and it's all true. Yeah. And so it's always interesting. And that's what they are, a falling out among thieves. We love you. Next week, Dr. Harriet Fraud is the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. You can listen to her here in New York at WBII. Plug away. Who are your co-hosts? My co-hosts are Ikoi Hiro and Liam Tate. Liam Tate from England, Ikoi Hiro from Japan and from California, and me. And um, I'm on BAI at 6.30 every time there, if the program isn't usurped by some special fundraiser or whatever, 6.30 on Tuesday nights. And Malachi McCord is in hospice. Do you know, do you know Malachi over WBI? Oh, he is. Yeah, I know yeah. he is. I don't like him so much as his brother, uh, Frank. His, po his politics were right yeah, they were much more braggadocio about his alcoholism rather than recognizing how sad it was, you know. Right. And he's much less compassionate. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, I thank love you. you. We love you. We'll see you next week, I hope. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Great thank job. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Here we go. Here we go. I'm David Feldman, and this is The Mop Up. In Nashville, Tennessee, three students and three adults are dead after a mass shooter stormed a local Christian school carrying two assault weapons and a pistol. The alleged shooter was identified as a former student and was killed by police. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has temporarily caved into public pressure and postponed a massive overhaul of his country's judicial system, Israel was hit today with massive protests and strikes after ultra-right-wing Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu unveiled legislation giving less power to the country's judicial branch. Protesters accused the Prime Minister of attempting a major power grab. The vote on the measure was delayed today in response to the massive outpouring on the streets. The European Union's foreign policy chief, and NATO have both condemned Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to install tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. In a statement this morning, the European Union called it, quote, an irresponsible escalation and threat to European security. The Manhattan grand jury looking into Donald Trump's secret hush money scheme to silence porn star Stormy Daniels on Monday heard from the former head of the National Enquirer, David Pecker. That's his name, David Pecker. The National Enquirer has been accused of performing what are called catch and kills, where they bought exclusive rights to women's stories of their sex with Donald Trump and then would bury the story to protect the candidate. The FEC says purchasing the silence of these women could serve as an illegal campaign contribution. For more on this and much more, let's go to Los Angeles, where Howie Klein is standing by. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for progressive candidates around the country. We just had a great fundraiser Friday night for maybe a girl. And... Uh, 
Howie is also uh, writes down with tyranny. And these are the things. Hello, Howie. I have some things that I wanted to talk to you about tonight. Good. Let's talk. These are the five stories. Well, that well, I, let me say something. When, okay. When you uh, were right, when you were talking just now about the news. Yes. I, 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 I got a weird feeling. Um, you know, one was one, one I don't really feel that bad about which is when they said that they shot and killed the uh, woman who uh, went in and started shooting. In right. So that, that's fine. I, you, know, I, you know, I admit it. You know, I was glad that they I, I'm her. having trouble hearing you. I said I was glad that they killed her. Right. Um, okay. So, but the thing that I, I had a little bit more trouble with was I felt a little kind of like relief that it wasn't a public school. I don't want to say the other part of it but i think it's obvious but i did feel like um, i was glad that it wasn't a public school that that uh where, where, the, where those six people were killed anyway in, that in, was ten- in, that in, in tennessee where in, in t- Nashville, yeah. yeah where they're passing more anti-drag anti-lgbtq laws than in any other state in america yeah and and you know there's a when you look at who to blame for all this stuff, like who's the real villain, uh, it, to me, it's the evangelical movement. So, to, you know, to tell me that, you know, uh, you know, a, a couple of hundred thousand evangelicals were killed. I, I, you know, I say, hey, you know, what a shame people got killed. Yes. No comment from, from me. Uh, I didn't make one either. You didn't make one either. You did not make one either. Here are the stories I want to talk to you about. What I've been going through, Down with Tyranny. Everybody should read Down with Tyranny. You're such a great writer. These are some of the stories you wrote about in the past couple of days. Brilliant piece on the Republican Party's war on education, dating all the way back to Edmund Burke, the the totemic pillar of conservatism. If we have time for that, I hope we can get to it. You also write about Republicans carrying the water for Donald Trump by proposing legislation that would strip local and state prosecutors from being able to prosecute former presidents. An incredible story over at Down with Tyranny. If we have time, I'd like to talk about TikTok. Should Democrats support banning TikTok in America? I don't think so. And this year, Virginia goes to the polls and you you interviewed a woman uh, who's running for a delegate in Virginia. I think she's already a delegate there. And she uses... No, no, no. She's not a delegate. She's running for delegate. Uh, Jessica Anderson, and we should definitely have her come on. She's amazing. Right. And a a, a social media influencer. And I've never met anybody who uses... Uh, TikTok uh, uh, more and better as, as an organizing tool. She's just amazing. I mean, she, this is going to be someone who wins because of t- TikTok. Right. So, of course, I asked her to to uh, write me a guest post about uh, about how she felt about what was going on uh, with TikTok. And instead of me discussing it, we should we should invite her to come on the show and talk about it. If, if you want, if that's a, su- a subject, I would love that. She, she's amazing. I mean, Jessica is an amazing woman. I would love that. And maybe we, if she, Jessica was, uh, you know, comes from a, uh, a she married a guy who's whose family was conservative, you know, Trump, Trump supporting Republicans. And she she lived with these people and uh, and and she realized that, no, you know, I'm, what am I doing with these people? And, and she's, you know, they got divorced. She left them and she um, uh, she became a Bernie person. Right. Right. Well, let, let's talk about TikTok because. Uh, <laughs> I, why don't we wait for, for Jessica? Uh, have okay. you ever been on TikTok? I never have. I've never uh, been on TikTok. I have not been on TikTok, TikTok. Uh, but but uh, I know that AOC is using it and a lot of Democrats think it's a great fundraising tool and would they'd be shooting themselves yeah. in well, the foot by getting the, rid of it. The video that I. The video that I uh, linked was AOC's very first TikTok video, which she did this weekend. So she hadn't done it before, but she was defending uh, TikTok's right to exist uh, since a lot of conservatives want to get rid of it. And, you know, and the point of the story was is that Democrats should not get involved. 
there are millions and millions, tens of millions of, of Americans who are using and loving TikTok. And if the Republicans want to get rid of it, let them let them do it. And Democrats shouldn't. But a lot of conservative Democrats are right there with the Republicans because they're jerks, just like the Republicans are. Right. I think it was you who wrote over at Down With Charity that the only concern about TikTok is what if there's a security breach, whereas we've already seen massive security breaches over at Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, that was that was Jessica who wrote that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's on my blog, but she, it was her guest post. Right. So I wasn't sure about TikTok until I read you and I realized, oh, this is this is a this is one more step towards real censorship where the Republicans can't wait to talk about First Amendment and freedom of speech. But they're the first ones to ban books and shut down TikTok. How many books have they banned so far? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Literally hundreds and hundreds of books across the country. Although when I was looking into it, although it's happening in, in, in very many red states, I mean, and red counties, uh, even like in you know normal places like Pennsylvania, red counties are banning books. But the vast majority of books that have been banned have been in Florida and Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the two, those two states are far more than the rest of the country combined. Those, those are the two, uh, the two bad guys in this, the two villains. Well, I wanted to ask you, I'm just going over a list of stories that I read over it down with tyranny that so I want. You did mention one. You, you did mention one, though, that uh, I thought was interesting, uh, that I thought would be interesting for our listeners. OK. And 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 this is about uh, I, I think this it started when I started writing it. I think it was uh, I think let me see the title was Bernie was right. There should be no billionaires. Right. This so is your latest. Oh, OK. So, uh, yes. So I started writing about billionaires in general. But then I, and then I that's when I sort of contacted Hal and started talking to Hal and saying, um, you know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, I don't know if they were billionaires at the time, but they were in effect the richest people in Germany and they would have been billionaires in today's money. But in other words, the richest families in Germany were the people who were funding Hitler. Uh, and, and literally the top, top families were giving Hitler the money even in the, in the late 1920s and into the 1930s. And the Nazi party wouldn't have existed without these uh, very, very wealthy people, none of whom got in any trouble. Like literally they all walked away scot-free and their their families are, you know, billionaires today. You bring up the book. We, anyway, we had the author of that book, uh, Zhang, yeah. on our show two times last yes. year. What is exactly the name of that old book? friend of mine. David DeJong. David DeJong. was, uh, yeah, David DeJong. Right. And, and his book was called, is called, it actually did really well, called Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties. But, but what I asked Hal about, you know, I, I discussed it with Hal uh, at some length. And then I said, you know, there are a lot of Jewish billionaires, oh boy. Jewish billionaires. Who were giving a large amount of money to the MAGA uh, movement, through, you know, both to Trump and to his committees. And I said, "Could you write a poem for me, in the style of Yitzhak or Yitzhak um, Manger?" So Yitzhak Manger, who who passed away uh, in I think in the uh, in 1969. So this is a guy who was born in 1901 in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now it's where he was born is now Ukraine. And, and he lived around Eastern Europe. He lived in Bucharest for a while. He, he did his greatest work when he lived in uh, Warsaw. And just before the war, he wound up getting deported from Poland and he wound up in England, luckily for him. Otherwise, he would have been killed. Uh, and then and then eventually he moved to New York for a very short time. He didn't like London very much. I don't think he was crazy about New York. And he wound up... Uh, going to Israel. He was there for 11 years before he died. But he's considered one of the greatest uh, uh, Yiddish poets. And so I asked Hal, can you write a story or a poem, I should say? When you say Hal, you were talking about artificial intelligence. That, that one, from two, the one from 2001, from that right. movie. Right. But you're yes. using artificial intelligence. Yes, Hal. And how do you I mean, actually... Hal, Hal, 
How do you stand for something? I can't remember. What it's remember IBM. What it it's one letter over from IBM. That's how they came up with it. Uh, that's how Arthur C. Clock came up with Hal. Hal is IBM. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it does. It does have. It does stand for something that H A L uh, comes from. Actually, no. It, Each it, of those letters. Hal is IBM. It's just one letter over in the alphabet. That's in two thousand and one. That's how Arthur C. Clark. Yeah. Came up with it. Okay, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to tell you what it what it means. Okay, because uh, it does mean it does mean something. When I was doing my research, I uh, I, I came across. It. I didn't know. Okay, here it is. Heuristically programmed uh, AL algorithm. So H is heuristically, and then programmed AL algorithm. Heuristically programmed algorithm computer. Okay. And that predates 2001, or did they come up with the acronym? No, no, that is that is from the movie in, in 1968. Okay, called uh, 2001. Anyway, I'm wrong. Uh, so, so here, here I asked how. Well, maybe not. I, I, I think both things can be. Why don't you ask how? I can ask. Hal gets very uptight when I ask him uh things about how he he sometimes I, if if we're having in a good conversation and it's going on for a while and i b slip it in he's cool but if i just start talking about it he gets wild and, okay and, can you slow and, down and, for and, one and, second and, so slow down for one yeah. second please because i was reading okay. down with tyranny and it is now i don't want to say lousy but uh, lousy with poetry from artificial intelligence you have a you are you made your bones, as they say, in the record industry. You ran Reprise Records, Warner Brothers. You gave us all these. You promoted all these great punk stars and Stevie Nicks and Chrissy Hind and all all the women I'm in love with. You are now toying. Joni, Joni, don't get Joni. You are now toying with fake poetry, which begs the question, what would have happened if this were around when you were in the music industry, considering how most of the time nobody really pays attention to Bob Dylan's lyrics, uh, you know, we'll give him a, a Nobel, but uh, you can get away with some really bad lyrics by not enunciating. What is this? What does this mean for poetry and most importantly, rock music and lyricists? Well, First, I, I can't get beyond what you just said about people not paying attention to lyrics. I, I don't know who those people are. Uh, everyone I know does pay attention to lyrics. And sure, there I guess there must be some that who I, don't. OK, but, I, Howie, but, Exile on Main Street is one of my favorite, favorite albums. I just found out that one of the songs was about Angela Davis after, you know, after listening to it for 30 years. I actually, I could, I've actually sat down and read the lyrics. I went, oh, it's about Angela Davis. You, Mick Jagger, you can't understand a word Mick Jagger is saying. Yeah, but I mean, that's the reason why, at least when we were kids, we had albums and they very often would include the lyrics on, in the, on the, uh, in but, the sleeves. But oftentimes they want, oftentimes they want the, it, it to be more chant like without you knowing what the lyrics are. I even think John Mellencamp admitted that sometimes it's better if you don't know what the lyrics is because your br lyrics are because your brain fills in fills it in for you and it becomes what you want it to be. I don't think lyrics. Well, the, the meaning the meaning can uh, be what, whatever you want it to be, but a good a good uh, writer does want you to hear his lyrics and interpret it the way you want to interpret it. I mean, certainly Bob Dylan wanted people to hear his lyrics now it's funny because the other day i i um was referencing a, a a bob dylan song called with god on our side right but rather than use bob dylan's i think is one of bob dylan's greatest uh songs i i think it's absolutely a masterpiece this was your and attack on the evangelicals you were, were going after the evangelicals uh, yeah well i, I yes with right because the, anyone who and not just the evangelicals but the orthodox jews and the the muslim uh, fanatics and the hindu fanatics i mean everybody who says god is on their side they're all the same mm -hmm. and, and i'm saying that they can't be part of government that the, these people are insane they can't be part of government and any government that they're part of 
turns into a fascist authoritarian regime, whether it's in Israel or in Iran or in India, in, in Modi's case, wherever they are. So but the point is, is that I didn't use Bob Dylan's version uh, of the song. When I, when I ran it, I ran uh, a, a, from a band called Wire Train, which was on my label, uh, 415 Records, before I came to work at Warner Brothers. And that was because they loved the song so much and the producer loved the song so much that they really did a version of it that's better than anything that Bob Dylan did. Now, that said, Bob Dylan wrote this brilliant song. That's the most important thing. Kevin Hunter and Wire Train and producer David Kahn. For some uh, reason, you're you're going on. You're, it sounds like you're underwater. I don't know why. I'm now you sound this good. Thing. Now you sound good. I wonder if I was t- I was touching a uh, a microphone. I have a new iPhone. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I, I, I it's a microphone that I was not uh, that I was like pressing up against. It's the best anyway, you've ever sounded, by the way. Good. So so anyway, we're we're going off from one tangent to another. But what I was trying to get to is, I, I mean, you asked me an interesting question about uh, the efficacy of how uh, doing poems, and you know. Uh, I, just when you called just now, I was writing about how I'm not satisfied with a couple of things he did for me. Uh, and and even I'm not satisfied because I know these artists personally and I know their work really well. Lou Reed and his wife, Lou's dead, but his wife, uh, Laurie Anderson. And I asked Hal to write for me songs that they could have written about the MAGA movement had they written about the MAGA movement. And I asked him to write the Lou Reed song in the style of um, the Velvet Underground and to do and to do a, a, a Laurie Anderson version. And he did. And they were OK. But they, they that was not a song that Lou Reed would ever have written the way he did it. And certainly not Laurie either. So it, it, it's imperfect. And, you know, in terms of professors grading work that's done by Hal, any professor who can't read this stuff and know that it's not that it's written by Hal is uh, is an idiot and shouldn't be a professor anyway. So most but professors of, won't be able to tell the difference. Well, you could be right in terms of Isaac uh, Manger. He didn't write in English. He only wrote in uh, in Yiddish. So I, I'm not familiar with his work. And when I asked uh, Hal to do this very specific task of of it, writing a poem that would warn Jewish billionaires not to give money to trump and not to give money to the maga movement i thought he did a good job uh, if Would it, you want to read it i don't know i'll read it sure i'll read it okay ready yeah okay in the land of the free where dreams are made some jewish billionaires have strayed they fund the maga movement with great glee blinded by power and their own money but have they forgotten history? Le- history's lesson, how Germany's wealthiest gave their profession to finance the Nazis who brought destruction and caused a world war, a devastating eruption. Their wealth was used to fuel hate and soon their nation met a terrible fate. The Holocaust and genocide were the cost of those who blindly followed and lost. Jewish billionaires heed this warning. Your wealth can be a force for good or mourning. Don't forget the lessons of our past and be careful where your money's cast. For those who ignore the past guidance will only lead to their own downfall and demise. Let us use our wealth to build a better tomorrow and not repeat the mistakes of sorrow. So, the, and the reason that well, I- I just want to point out your, that that's, that's not, that's uh, an anti-Semitic, AI. That's Heil, not Hal. You went to the, the, the uh, you went to the wrong one. One. Of the, one of the reasons why I, I I got into this today was because do you, you know who Robert Kraft is? He, he's yeah. a, he's a Jewish uh, multi billionaire. He owns the Patriots, the Boston football team, and, and goes he's, to he's massage Trump. parlors. He, yeah, he does go to massage parlors. He's a, although that's been erased from the memory bank. He um, he's a Trumper. And he has given millions of dollars to Trump and the mega movement. Uh, he also gives to Democrats, usually very conservative ones. But he is definitely a Trumper without any question. Well, as of tonight, he is spending 
25 million dollars in an ad campaign uh, that's going to run for the first time on The Voice tonight. And he expects that every American, I don't know how he expects this, but he expects that every American will see one of these six ads 10 times over the next six weeks. And these are ads that are trying to uh, combat anti-Semitism. Well, how did this anti-Semitism blossom in the United States in the last two years to such a big extent? Because people like him gave so much money to the MAGA movement, which is the most anti-Semitic movement in our in contemporary America. So uh, so that that was what inspired me to discuss this with Hal and to get him to write that little poem that I just read. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't feel I gave it justice in, in the read. I'm sorry. Well, you're, you're, my mind is spinning. You got you got me going off in two separate directions. One, I want to stay oh, good. with do that to me. the artificial intelligence I'm fascinated by, but I find it very haunting. You, you know, when you bring up Kraft and Sheldon Adelson, who passed away, but the wife is still alive. And these and still giving money to Republicans, these ultra orthodox Jews who are as bad as the evangelicals when it comes to their support and bigotry and yes, me- they're menace. Yes, exactly the same as the evangelicals. They're the same. And the same as the Taliban and the same as the nutcases in uh, uh, in India that stop trains and kill all the Muslims on the trains. They're, they, these are all crazy people. And we're seeing it with Netanyahu in Israel, who here's a man, Netanyahu, the current prime minister, who has made his bed not just with Donald Trump, but with Viktor Orban in Hungary, who's an anti-Semite, who when you say George Soros, you're saying Jew. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu is making making uh, his bed with anti-Semites, people who would march him into an oven. What is he thinking? Is he that stupid or does he have some plan that doesn't, how do you explain the stupidity of these far right Israeli leaders? I think, I think in the case of Netanyahu, it's, it's just a survival instinct. He is on the verge of going to prison and he'll do anything to keep himself and his wife out of prison. He's a criminal. He and the law is closing in on him just the way it's closing in on Trump. And Trump would just as soon bring down the whole country than wind up for one day in jail. Uh, But, you know, you mentioned earlier that Netanyahu, when you were reading the news, that Netanyahu was postponing the, um, uh, you know, this judicial reform, so-called reform. And yes, he is. But it's interesting. He he fired the defense minister. Another member of his cabinet uh, said he agrees with the defense minister, in effect, challenging Netanyahu to fire him as well. The uh, council general in New York, the Israeli council general in New York tweeted two words, I resign. Uh, and there's a general strike, a Ben-Gurion airport closed down, mm-hmm. big international airport. All of the presidents of universities are going on. <laughs> presidents of universities are going on strike. Yeah. yeah. Everyone is on strike. The, the, you know, the biggest labor union in the country is on strike. Uh, and you know, the, the Israel is, is, is a, exa- like the United States. It's very, very divided, you know, evenly divided. Netanyahu only won because it, it, their system, their, their electoral system is very screwed up and an, enough small left wing parties didn't got, got, didn't get enough votes to get any, any, any uh, seats in the parliament. And because of that, Netanyahu wind up with the uh, uh, with the most seats, not by many, just a couple. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is, is if the all of the left wing parties would have like just gotten behind one or two parties, they would have won. So so it's, it's a it's a very you know screwed up electoral system. The election was awful. Netanyahu is acting as though he had this landslide victory when he didn't even have a victory. Right. Uh, it, it's, just, it's what right wingers do all the time. Let me and, ask you, let me throw you a curve. Say, is, anyway, before, before let me you, throw you a curve you want, ball. I, I just want to finish this thought before yeah, we yeah. go to something else, which is that the the number one fascist in the country, this guy, I think Ben Alvier or something, said that if Netanyahu doesn't go through with the uh, the reform of the Supreme Court, he would quit the cabinet. 
So I don't know what what happened today when when I mean, at first uh, Netanyahu withdrew his statement that he would he would do it. He would postpone it. And then he went ahead and did it. So I don't know what he promised this uh, Ben Gavir. Uh, and I don't know, maybe Ben Gavir is leaving, which would be great since he's he is literally, literally the worst Nazi in, in a fairly Nazi cabinet. Right. I, now you were going to. Yeah, I read an yours. article. I, I wanted to ask you about this. It's a bit of a curveball. I was reading foreign policy last night. And I forgive me. I forgot the author of this piece. He said that there's a minor civil war going on in Israel and it's reminiscent of the antebellum north where 20 years before the Civil War, people in the North were fighting over everything other than we got to get rid of slavery. They, they, they won't address the elephant in the room. And he said the fighting in Israel right now is they're not addressing the elephants in the room is what are we going to do about the Palestinians? We, we are we are committing human. This, we're a human rights disaster where we are an undemocratic state, and we're acting as if everything's fine and it's not, well, that seeps into everyday life and you start turning on one another. And until they address the Palestinians and the Arab community living in Israel and Palestine writ large, they will, the Israelis will eat themselves alive the same way America did before the Civil War, before we resolve slavery. You can't have this kind of sin taking place and ignoring it without it eventually consuming you. Yes. Okay. You're right. I agree. Artificial intelligence. The, the guy who I just mentioned, uh, this guy Ben Gavir, or I, I could be pronouncing his name wrong, he is the, uh, the Minister of Security. He is literally the one who wants to exterminate the Palestinians. So you, you don't want him involved with determining uh, what happens to the Palestinians who live in Israel. Uh, you don't want to get him anywhere near it. So we, the, really the start of this is getting rid of uh, Netanyahu's uh, extreme right wing government. And, 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 and American and, and American and, Jews have to pressure Biden to tell the Israelis to get their arms around this situation because it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Right. They, well, and I mean, Amer the American uh, Jewish billionaires like Kraft, for example, who has spent uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, propping up the Israeli government and the Likud, Likud party, he and, and many, many others, uh, they don't have to go through Biden. They can go right to Netanyahu. Right. Um, but and, and there's some of that happening now. But remember, the Republican Party is is APAC. There's the, uh, you know, there's no there's now no difference between APAC and the Republican Party. And you've got, you know, so many Democrats, probably more than half who are, are also enthralled to APAC, including Hakeem Jeffries, the head of the uh, and uh, Chuck Schumer. So we, we have a real problem uh, there. Yeah. Uh, it, the Israelis are going to uh, if they're going to solve this, it's, I am afraid it's not going to be with uh, any real help from uh, or guidance from the U.S. OK, you wrote a great piece over at Down with Tyranny about the calls to eliminate the Department of Education. This has been going on for decades that the Repub the Republicans hate the idea that there's a Department of Education. And you gave a history of the conservative movement's war against education dating all the way back to Edmund Burke. People should read this. Do you mind briefly going over this? Well, I, I, I love going over it because I think it's such an important piece. Unfortunately, uh, we've gone over uh, over our time next week. And I have. A, yes. OK, let's do it next week. We'll go. Are you kidding? Are we over? Time? Oh, my God. We are over time. Howie Klein is the founder where does the time go howie klein is the founder and treasurer of the blue america pack he raises money for great progressive candidates like maybe a girl who we did a benefit for friday night hopefully we'll do one again and read him right now go to down with tyranny and read these stories we've been talking about follow him on twitter at down with tyranny 
Thank you so much, Howie Klein. Thank you. And, and I think it's worth uh, telling our, our listeners that we, we raised a significant amount of money for maybe your girl. when you did, when you, What is that thing called that you do? That Office hours. Week? Office hours. Office hours. Yes. I mean, maybe with like thrill. Right. Fantastic. We'll do it again. Good. Thank you, Howie. Okay. See Thank you soon. You. See you next week, I hope. Bye. That is Howie Klein over at Down With Tyranny. Read him all the time over at uh, Down With Tyranny. He is a uh, national treasure. And please like this episode. If you could do that for us, it helps. There we go. I'm trying to lower something here. Uh, yeah, I like this. And the only reason you're listening to me right now is because somebody copied and pasted the link to this episode and shared it with you either through email or via social media. So if you enjoyed Howie Klein and you think other people could learn from him, please uh, copy and paste this and share this. It's the only way anybody has discovered this show. We're not part of any network. Uh, nobody in power is helping us. Uh, once again, thank you to everybody who showed up for office hours Friday night. Anybody who donated gets a, <clears throat> what is it? Stay strong and protect the weak bumper sticker. Anybody who donated to maybe a girl gets a stay strong and protect the weak bumper sticker. We do office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm there from 8 till 930. And I make myself available to all the listeners who want to talk about anything. I'm there. Leave a comment. I read all your comments. People who are already part of this growing community know that wherever you post your comments, I read them. You can see ideas, topics uh, from the comment section going directly into the show. A lot of uh, things you tell me to talk about, I talk about. So I, the comment section has become a lifeline for this podcast. So thank you for leaving comments. And please subscribe to my newsletter. Please uh, subscribe. Thank you, Dr. Mordecai Cassius Marcellus Jones. You just sent me a super sticker. I have new technology that can tell me if somebody sent me a super sticker. Uh, please come to office hours and sign up for my newsletter. It comes out every Friday. And in it, you get the link for office hours. Go to my website for all that information. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. All right. All right. Hey, I want to thank everybody for showing up for Friday's big fundraiser for Maybe a Girl. Thank you. We had a nice turnout. And we raised some money. Thank you, Howie Klein. Every Friday night, we're going to be doing either fundraisers or lectures at office hours. Go to my website for a link. I'm David Feldman. David Feldman has the night off. And this is the mop up. I don't feel like doing anything tonight, right? Go watch uh, my... Uh, 20th anniversary of Iraq. I thought that that took a lot out of me. All right. This is the news. As Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg prepares his hush money indictment, former President Donald Trump spent most of Friday at Mar-a-Lago feverishly practi practicing his perp walk. <laughs> That's Trump practicing his Perp walk. He wants to look good. Trump on Friday took to social media and complained that only 10% of the people living in Manhattan voted for Bragg, which is still 10% more than the people living in Manhattan who voted for Trump. Trump warned that if the Manhattan DA puts him in jail, there will be, quote, death and destruction. Yeah, of Trump's butt. <laughs> I'm taking the night off. 
you know, oftentimes white people, white people, oftentimes white people sent to prison run the risk of being forced to join a white extremist Nazi gang. Luckily, Trump doesn't have to worry about that since he's already a Republican. Since there was no arrest this week, Trump was able to appear at his big rally in Waco, Texas, Saturday night. Here we see MAGA supporters in Waco lining up early Friday morning just to get a good seat from uh, for Trump's big speech. They're, they're just look at all those Trump supporters lining up to to see to see him. Wanting, wanting to savor his 15 minutes of fame, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg walks the more fashionable streets of New York City's Upper East Side, approaching attractive women with, hi, I'm Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, and right here in my breast pocket is an Alvin indictment for you to meet me for drinks at the Carlisle in 15 minutes. He carries an Alvin indictment to pick up women. Clearly unnerved by indictments pending in Manhattan, Georgia, and Washington, D.C., Donald Trump kept interrupting his speech in Davenport, Iowa, by pointing to members of the crowd and shouting, are you a process server? How about you? Are you a process server? How about you? No, no, the ugly one. No, no, the other ugly one. Are you a process server? No, no, not you, the ugly one sitting next to the fat one. No, not the fat one. Okay, you see that row of disgusting pigs? No, not that row of disgusting, morbidly obese pigs. Okay, you see that row of horse-faced dogs behind the row of saggy old people in front of the row of flatulent, greasy, toothless cretins? Are you a process? Forget it. Arriving at the second floor to step out, Senator Elizabeth Warren was ambushed by reporters demanding her response to Senator Lindsey Graham's allegation that she was the one who just passed wind in the elevator. As usual, Fed Chair Jer Jerome Powell can't remember if raising interest rates is good for inflation and bad for unemployment are good for unemployment and bad for inflation. After announcing his ninth interest rate increase in a row, Fed Chair Jerome Powell slinked out in shame after his press conference turned hostile when he began reading the first three chapters of Indigo Kiss, a 19th century romance novel he's working on that takes place in the antebellum South. <laughs> because I'm taking the night off because he's an 80 year old white man. Joe Biden is of the generation where he thinks it's still OK to snap your fingers to get the busboy's attention at the Olive Garden. One of the many downsides to being Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is right after your die-hard, illiterate voters buy your new book, they wave it in your face, demanding to know what it says. Arriving at the podium, Ron DeSantis had absolutely nothing to say after realizing instead of Toni Morrison's beloved, he accidentally banned his own speech. Yeah, that's tough when you, when you ban your own speech. And so Ron DeSantis was forced to launch into his old standby and perform an overtly racist, homophobic and misogynistic version of Bob Newhart's famous phone call to God bit. There are some who think French President Emmanuel Macron picked the wrong week to host his own gender reveal party. Washington insiders are now saying South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott thinks he can win the GOP nomination for president with one simple message. A vote for me proves you're not a racist. Hmm. Because he hasn't bathed since Jacques Chirac was president, 
Gaston was allowed to march with the other French protesters only after he promised to keep a fully lit jumbo sized stick of insect repellent beside him at all times. <laughs> Because the French are better than we are in every way, Americans would be surprised to know this is what French labor activists call a light turnout. This is a light turnout in France for a protest. Well, with French garbage men on strike, word on the street is Parisian rodents Parisian rats and rodents are now referring to March of 2023 as Les Belles Epoques. Les Belles Epoques. Let's go full screen on this one. Even though it's been two weeks, Australian director Baz Luhrmann's face is still celebrating its Oscar win for Best Special Effects. Congratulations, Boz Lerman's face. Actor Gwyneth Paltrow is being sued by a 76-year-old optometrist over who's to blame for a ski collision that took place on the bunny slope of a Park City, Utah ski resort. During testimony this week, Paltrow told jurors, who are you going to believe? Some eye doctor who nobody ever heard of? Or the woman who's made millions telling women to steam clean their vaginas before shoving a hornet's nest up there. I'm going to believe the woman who's made millions telling women to steam clean their vaginas before shoving a hornet's nest up there. Gwyneth Paltrow, and I wish I were making this up. Gwyneth Paltrow is now recommending rectal ozone therapy. Rectal ozone therapy, which might explain why her company is named Goop. Paltrow appearing again. I wish I was making this up. Paltrow appearing on a wellness podcast this week said she's never felt better ever since she began shooting ozone into her rectum. You know, in a few short years, we've gone from worrying about a hole in the ozone to worrying about ozone in the hole. Practitioners of alternative medicine call this rectal insufflation, while others call it a relatively plausible excuse for sticking things up your ass. You know what would make the rest of us feel a whole lot better, Gwyneth? Putting a cork in your mouth. Have you tried that? Have you tried putting a cork in your mouth? During this week's visit to Kiev, Prince William negotiated with the Ukrainian soldier seen on the left to get the Ukrainian soldier seen here on the right to admit he stole the hat he's wearing from King Charles's wife, Camilla, at Queen Elizabeth's funeral. Yeah, that is, that's the kind of hat Camilla would wear at a funeral or ascot, I believe. Well, later that day in Ukraine, William met with President Zelensky and a team of generals for a strategy session on how best to neutralize a certain American sister-in-law. Hmm. In Moscow on Tuesday, meeting with Vladimir Putin, President Xi Jinping excuses himself, saying he must go to the bathroom and do number five, which is code for beef and broccoli. This portion of the David Feldman Show is brought to you by George Soros, bringing you one world global government and FEMA death camps since 2005. Well, because it's all about egalitarian awareness, French riots always offer a choice between smoking and non-smoking. Yes, we must be egalitarian. This is the view of Joe Biden attending a congressional luncheon, looking through Marjorie Taylor Greene's right ear and straight out through her left. If you were going to look at Joe Biden uh, attending this week's congressional luncheon and you this would this is the view. This picture was taken uh, going through Marjorie Taylor Greene's right ear and straight out through her left because there's nothing there. Well, 
once the world's most difficult and prestigious, the Tour de France this month became the stinkiest. Yeah, that's got to be tough, right? Poor guy. A coward like his father before him and his father before him and his father before him, during riots, French gendarme Michel, French gendarme Michel, always stands behind his idiot, his idiot friend, Marcel, the human shield Balzac, and says, move forward. I got your back. No, go, go forward. Don't worry. I, I'm right behind you. Just move forward. Just rocks and bullets. Keep keep moving forward. Receiving the much coveted three stars from Michelin, executive chef Fateh Fateh 2 by 4 Executive chef Fateh Fateh 2 by 4 his new restaurant Street is single-handedly responsible for the rise in popularity of garbage bag to table French cuisine. It's quite delicious. Garbage bag to table French cuisine. It all started at the restaurant in Paris named Street. Executive chef Fate Fate <laughs> two, by, two by four. I'm taking the night off. After defacing the French presidential palace this week to protest Emmanuel Macron's decision raising the retirement age to 64, famed graffiti artist Jacques Saint Pollock tells protesters his message is only for people who are not too stupid to understand it. Some tickets to see Bruce Springsteen in Buffalo are now selling for $5,000 a piece. A working class hero, the boss, says he wishes he could charge five grand a piece for every ticket, but the $5,000 tickets are reserved solely for fans who are financially strapped. The rest of you have to f pay full price. Only the... Uh, only the fans of Bruce Springsteen who are financially strapped uh, get the, the cheaper seats at $5,000 a piece. Because he knows she hates him to the core of her very being, Donald Trump only fakes sip glasses of water handed to him by his wife, Melania. White House insiders say Joe Biden is remaining silent on Donald Trump's legal problems, partly because he doesn't want to influence the criminal prosecutions, but mostly because Biden can't remember who Donald Trump is. The, uh, the Senate confirmed Daniel Werfel to be the new commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service in a vote 54 to 42 winning the support of six Republicans when, under oath, he demonstrated how, as IRS commissioner, he would personally audit Megan the Stallion's ass. Wow. That's, that's how you get the Republican vote, I guess. While angry protests continue to mount on the streets of Paris, with garbage cans and eggs tossed at gendarmes trying to maintain order, the French police union is now insisting President Emmanuel Macron lower their retirement age to 25. To mark the 20th anniversary of America's illegal invasion of Iraq, George W. Bush decided the best way to honor the soldiers he sent into harm's way would be by getting the old war cabinet back together again and try and solve the series finale for ABC's The Goldbergs. Isn't that sweet? That's the best way to honor the troops he sent into harm's way, trying to solve the series finale for ABC's The Goldbergs, the war cabinet. Well, because he's 80, Joe Biden must be reminded that what he thinks is a shiny, bright light summoning him over to the other side is, in fact, his son Hunter in the Rose Garden smoking crack. 
Wrapping up their big Moscow meeting, Presidents Xi and Putin presented each other with memory albums featuring their favorite moments from the summit, including photographs, handwritten notes to each other, crushed flowers from the dinner banquet, and pressed human toes. You can always tell Donald Trump is thinking about his daughter Ivanka by the way he absentmindedly starts making the jerking off motion with his right hand. With pressure from the Manhattan DA mounting, much of Donald Trump's speech in New Hampshire this week was basically him sizing up each individual <laughs> member of the crowd. Sizing up each individual... <laughs> Sorry. With pressure from the Manhattan DA mounting, much of Donald Trump's speech in New Hampshire this week was basically him sizing up each individual member of the crowd to decide whether he needs to make a run for it. I think he's nervous. Instead of prescribing Prilosec, Ron DeSantis's gastroenterologist tells the Florida governor acid reflux is best treated by not listening to any speeches delivered by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Jeff Bezos's girlfriend always has plump lips because Jeff Bezos can only get off. He can only get off by watching as she repeatedly sticks her face inside a hornet's nest while screaming in agony. Well, some public speakers, when they get nervous, like to imagine the audience completely naked. Ron DeSantis, however, prefers imagining he's sneaking up behind the audience and removing its bra strap without consent. <laughs> it's not nice. Watching footmen scurry about, satisfying his every desire. At age 74, King Charles III can't help but imagine how much better life would have turned out for him had his dear mama dropped dead 50 years ago. Meanwhile, Charles announced he was postponing a planned visit to France due to the ongoing protests. King Charles was hoping for a quick meeting with President Emmanuel Macron, and then he planned to drop by the Parisian Tunnel, made famous by Doty and Diana, or Camilla, and he liked to fornicate. During an official state visit to Canada, Joe Biden and wife Jill asked Prime Minister Trudeau, for the name of that guy who can hook them up with some inexpensive Vicodin and Cialis. Because Senate Banking Committee Chairman Sherrod Brown suffers from extreme mental illness, last week's hearings would not come to order until Fed Chair Jerome Powell showed proof of a fully picked nose. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced today that he struck a deal with Belarusian leader Alexander Lugashenko in which Russia would agree to deploy tactical nuclear weapons inside the Belarusian borders if Lukashenko would agree to stand seven inches shorter. A high school principal in Florida was fired after parents complained six graders were shown a picture of Michelangelo's David. Parents weren't upset by David's junk. Instead, the Florida parents were horrified that David is depicted holding a slingshot instead of an assault rifle. And that would upset the people of Florida. Gordon Moore, the philanthropist and founder of computer chip giant Intel, passed away this week at the age of 94. And I believe we have an exclusive photo of his coffin. Yes, uh, you know, it's uh, Gordon Moore's coffin because uh, right there it says Intel inside. 
I've been David Feldman taking the night off. I'm not in the mood to do anything tonight. Uh, please like this video. It was kind of lazy, but fun. Saturday night. And what else do you need to do? Subscribe to this channel. Like and subscribe to this channel, please. It helps. Makes me happy. And most importantly, leave a comment in the comment section down below. My regular listeners know that my show is shaped by your comments. I read them. And the only reason you're listening to this show right now or watching this show is because a friend of yours had the, the wherewithal to copy and paste the link to this to an episode and either share it via email or on social media. If you want to help me, if you want to thank me for this show, the best way to thank me is by copying and pasting this episode. I'm not sure you're going to want to with this one. <laughs> I kind of took the night off tonight. Uh, but, uh, if you enjoy any of my episodes, please copy and paste them and share them with your friends. Nobody is, uh, promoting this for obvious reasons. And I read all your comments. You can tell that I've read your comment. There'll be a heart next to it. Thank you for your comments. Please like this. Please share this. Please subscribe to my channel and please subscribe to my newsletter by going to David Feldman show. Dot com. My newsletter comes out every Friday and it contains the link for office hours. We do office hours every Friday night from eight till nine thirty. I make myself available to all my listeners from eight till nine thirty Friday night at eight p.m. Eastern. And if you want to talk to me, if you want to make some suggestions and we'll have some guests, I think the Reverend Barry W. Lynn were not confirmed but I think the Reverend Barry W. Lynn will be there Friday night to launch his new book. And uh, maybe Professor Adnan Hussein will be talking with him. And I think we'll do a recording session for the podcast Friday night. So if you'd like to watch how we record the podcast, come by. Thank you for coming by Friday. Uh, last Friday, we raised... Uh, some money for maybe a girl. Thank you for donating. And the people who were there and donated to maybe a girl who's running for California's 30th congressional district, they all got a stay strong and protect the weak bumper sticker. Well, they're going to get one mailed to them. It's a virtual meeting on Zoom. You should show up. Nobody's going to see you. Nobody's going to hear you. It's, you can just lurk. If you want to talk, you're welcome. If you just want to listen, you're free to do that. Is that everything? It is. Okay. Thank you for watching this. I'm David Feldman, filling in for David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.